One more time. Perfect. Okay. Great. Let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you all for coming out. It is my pleasure to call this meeting to order. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the workshop on the macroeconomic implications of decarbonization policy and actions. And this is the third workshop in a series as part of the roundtable on macroeconomics and climate related risks and opportunities. I am Sonia Carley. I'm a Presidential Distinguished Professor of Energy Policy and City Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also the Faculty Director of the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy. I will provide introduction and remarks in just a little bit, but first I'd like to turn the floor over to our esteemed colleague who has been the driving force behind all of this, Katrina Hoy. Hello, good morning. Um, Annie, could you please do the next slide? So welcome everyone to the workshop. Um, first, I'm gonna start with a moment to consider our safety in this building for those who are here in person. So welcome to the National Academy of Sciences building. This is a map of our building. I will point out that today we are mostly in here. So we are in the lecture room in the East Court. And I wanna note that we have several different exits around the building in case of any emergencies. And also importantly, um, just from this East Court where we have the registration across the hall, that's where the closest restrooms are located. Um, but at any point today, if you do need help finding anywhere, um, there are several different National Academy staff scattered around the room, so you can always ask us for help. Um, let's see, perfect. So as I had sort of mentioned earlier, um, what we found at the National Academies for our hybrid meetings that works well is that we really try to have everyone on Zoom. For those who are here in person, uh, we ask you to connect to Zoom, and importantly, we ask you to please make sure that your computer speakers are off. And also when you join the Zoom, please do not join the audio. All the audio will be coming through all the microphones that are on all the tables. Um, Zoom will probably ask you several times to turn the audio on, just keep ignoring it and telling it no. <laughs> for those who are virtual, thank you for joining us on Zoom. Um, and we just ask please that you mute yourself while you're not speaking. Um, and then for all participants, I want to say that we have, um, the Zoom chat today is only for if you have any technical issues and need some help. Uh, we will be directing all questions and comments through our Slido that we've set up. So for those in person, we have some printouts with the QR code and information on how to find that. And throughout the day, we will be uh, sharing the Slido link on the Zoom chat for those who are joining us virtually. And finally for this, we do encourage people to turn on their cameras when they're joining. Um, it does support a sense of community throughout the hybrid meeting. Thank you. Um, and finally, um, in all of the National Academy activities, we have expectations for conduct. So we are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, inclusive environment where all participants can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on any identity-based factors. Um, and so if you're interested to learn more about our policy on preventing discrimination, harassment, and bullying, you can visit the link here. It's also available in our public briefing materials on the event page. And also if you, oh, no worries. Um, and also, Um, I do want to know also if you do witness or see anything throughout the meeting that you would like to report, you can always email me. Um, my email is on the event page as well, um, or you can email National Academy's HR. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass back to Sonia. Wonderful. Thank you, Katrina. All right, so just a little bit of background to introduce us to our, our challenge and our forum today, uh, beginning with the National Academies. The National Academies is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is the nation's preeminent source of expert evidence-based and objective advice on science, engineering, and health matters. The National Academies provides independent objective advice to inform policy with objective scientific findings, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. 
This advice is provided through a variety of different forums, including ones like what we're doing today with workshops, but also with roundtables and reports and a variety of other outcomes or outputs rather. Just a little bit of background about this workshop specifically. This is part of a series of, of plant or of events that we'll host. The National Academies initiated the Roundtable on Macroeconomics and Climate Related Risks and Opportunities back in 2022. This roundtable is a neutral venue for cross-disciplinary experts from academia, private business, civil society, government, and other stakeholder groups to discuss how transition and physical risks of climate change affect the macroeconomy and its implications for associated public policy. The roundtable's work plan includes two workshops roughly per year and possibly more going forward. This workshop is the third in the series. Uh, I'd like to also point out the sponsors for this workshop and with great appreciation, the National Science Foundation, NOAA, Bezos Earth Fund, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the Wallace Global Fund. Here's our committee roster. This is the group that was behind, the driving force behind putting together this workshop. There are two members here on this committee who are a part of the round table. The remainder of the committee or the rest of the committee was selected through a nomination process that the National Academies hosted. These are leading experts within the topic of decarbonization and the macro economy. This is an exceptional group of individuals who put together what I hope you agree with me, a really phenomenal list of speakers that we have uh, today and tomorrow. I'm most appreciative for all of you. I'm also gonna point out how appreciative I am of the National Academy staff for all of the work that they've done behind the scenes. In particular, our leader, Katrina, has done a phenomenal job, as well as so much uh, additional support from Bridget and Brent and Annie and others, so thank you. Our statement of task, here it is, it's big, it's long, I won't read this specifically. Uh, to summarize in, in a few shorter words, our statement of task is to focus on the macroeconomic implications of decarbonization policies and actions. And really our objective here is a two-way interaction. We're looking at both the effect of decarbonization on the macroeconomy and the effect of the macroeconomy on decarbonization. Maybe I'll also point out a line here in this slide. The goal of the workshop is to distill key insights from scientific and economic research efforts that may inform equitable and effective public policy within the broader macroeconomic landscape. And we will explore climate change mitigation pathways and transitions to decarbonization, their macroeconomic and socioeconomic implications and the role of the macroeconomy in achieving these decarbonization goals. Now, both the roundtable leading into the formation of this workshop committee and the plans for the workshop, and then subsequently the committee that took up this charge, identified several key themes that we wanted to focus on in, in these two days of workshops. Here are the key themes, and I'm going to summarize each of them briefly. The first is focusing on economic and other forms of risks. And risks here we define as potential adverse outcomes that could emerge through the decarbonization process. Risks uh, can be presented in the form of financial risks, labor, supply chains, and the political economy. Now, I'll also note that it's not just focused, we're not just focused here on risks on the downside, but also the opportunities that may emerge as well. The second are barriers, and barriers here we define as obstacles that may stand in the way or obstruct progress. And potential barriers here are uh, technical, social, legal, political, and a variety of other op obstacles that we'll focus on. Third, we're particularly interested in how do we model some of these dynamics? How do we model energy systems, for example? How do we model and integrate the social science side into our macroeconomic and our climate applications? So here in our, in our third session, we will focus on these uh, modeling insights. Fourth, we're interested in global dynamics. And here we're interested in the interplay between the US economy and supply chains, other nations' energy transitions, and the global economy in the context of the global energy transition. Now, we also identified several cross-cutting themes that I'm hopeful that you will hear throughout every single one of our sessions over the next two days. These include the role of public policy, equity and distributional effects, and temporal dimensions. Where policy is, we're thinking about what is the role of public policy? How do we kickstart? How do we use policy to kickstart transitions? How do we identify complementary approaches to mitigate risk and to address equity challenges? Equity and distributional effects include challenges such as local and regional distributional and structural change effects and their implication for certain geographic and demographic populations, including underserved, underrepresented, and vulnerable populations. 
And the temporal dimension is we're interested in both looking back and looking forward and always keeping in mind the complications and the challenges of, of both directions. Uh, just a few notes about how we will proceed. We have a variety of plenary sessions uh, throughout the course of the next two days. We are gathering information uh, at this workshop and through other engagement opportunities, which will then inform the broader roundtable discussions about the macroeconomic uh, implications of climate opportunities and risks. Uh, there will also be a staff off authored proceedings that will be published after the workshop, just as there has been for the first two workshops. And I believe that there's actually proceedings that are available at the, the front desk if you're interested in picking one up uh, to, to catch yourself up to speed if you missed any of them. Here's our workshop agenda. We have two, two days of this. This is the, the first day. You can see that we have welcoming remarks as well as opening keynotes, really hitting on all of the key themes that we will cover. We will then have a first panel on economic risks, lunch, a second panel on barriers to decarbonization as well as solutions. Uh, we'll break and then the remainder of the day will be focused on both a poster session as well as a group report back and reflection opportunity altogether. Now the poster session is, I, I hope you find it quite fun. We put out an open call identifying key themes and it was a competitive process where we essentially brought in many uh, applications. We reviewed them and we identified the, the best of the best. They're both virtual and in person. Here's our second day, here is tomorrow. We will again open with a keynote. We will then have a panel on modeling insights followed by another panel on global interactions. We'll break for lunch. And then we'll have a series of interactive breakout sessions where we have very uh, specific topics identified that we would like to all discuss and report back before we wrap up for the day. Just to end, I know that Katrina already mentioned the Slido. Here's just a little bit more information about it. It is super easy. You can either use the QR code that's uh, at your, your space, or you can just go to slido.com and right up at the top, it will ask for this code. The code is macro decarb. Uh, so feel free just to do that at any time that you're ready. And then as we go through the different panel sessions, please feel free to add comments, feedback, and particularly questions. All right, well, thank you again for joining us today. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Jay Edmonds who is leading our first keynote session. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining uh, both in person and online. Uh, we're looking forward to a really uh, great opening session as well as two days of really uh, exciting uh, developments in the field of, of uh, climate macro. Uh, I'm a, a lab fellow at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and a professor of public policy at the University of Maryland. Uh, before we, uh, we, we, we turn to our next uh, two speakers, both of whom will be virtual, um, that they, they being uh, Stephen Davis and Nat uh, Bullard, uh, our goal for this session uh, is to assess uh, where uh, we are currently in the energy transition and decarbonization process. And to better understand uh, what we are currently doing well, what approaches are working, what approaches need to be adjusted, uh, what are the areas that we need research, uh, and what are the potential innovative approaches uh, that we need to consider. So uh, for uh, the benefit of our two speakers, uh, we will have uh, a presentation, one by each. Uh, each speaker will be allotted 10 minutes uh, to provide their um, uh, keynote remarks. Uh, I'll give a verbal one minute warning uh, at the nine minute mark. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, conclude at the 10 minute mark. Uh, we'll have a couple of questions after each speaker uh, and then uh, leave the remainder of the time uh, for Q&A, and hence the Slido uh, that we, uh, were, uh, we were discussing just a moment ago. Uh, once again, speakers uh, have um, offered, once the, the speakers have offered their opening remarks, uh, we'll have a larger Q&A, uh, and uh, at any time during uh, the remarks, uh, if you have a question, that's what Slido is for. Uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen or click on the link uh, in the chat. Uh, so 
Uh, let me, uh, without further ado, turn to our first keynote speaker, Stephen Davis. Uh, he's a Stanford professor and a person with whom I've had the pleasure of working uh, many times over the years. Uh, he is professor of Earth System Science uh, in the Stanford uh, Dewar School of Sustainability. Uh, his research focuses on how different human activities are affecting climate and air quality and how those environmental changes in turn jeopardize human well-being and the relative priority of solutions. So uh, with that, uh, let me welcome uh, Stephen uh, and uh, turn the, uh, the floor over to him. Thanks, Jay, and, and thanks to all the organizers for putting this together and inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm only regretful that I'm not there in person with all of you. Um, should I share my own slides, or was that something you guys were going to put up? Can you hear me, Jay? Hi, Steve. This is Katrina speaking. We are going to share your slides, and so when okay. you want us to move to the next one, you can just ask for the next slide. Okay, that sounds good. There's a few that have animations that will be annoying, and I'll just tell you to push uh, next a bunch of times. Okay, you can go to the first slide. So as Jay mentioned, the, the organizers asked me to kind of take stock of where we are both in the energy transition in reality as well as research on it. And so I thought I would start with something that won't be news to any of you all, which is, and you can press the button a couple of times, Katrina, um, the costs of some of these key technologies like wind and energy as well as electric vehicle batteries has been plummeting over the past decade or so as capacities uh, worldwide and in the US have really increased. And so I think it's hard to find anyone anymore who doesn't think that these are the cost-effective core technologies that will be at the root of the energy transition that we're planning. And I'll leave it at that because uh, you know Nat is gonna have far better graphics uh, to show you in a minute, but you wanna advance it to the next slide, Katrina. Thanks. So, you know, deploying those things for the next couple of decades is going to keep us quite busy, but I would say there's a lot more that we as researchers are still working on and need to figure out. And really, I think there are two main frontiers for this uh, research. One is really cost related. So costs are probably going to be driven by the really difficult sources of emissions to abate beyond just the, the solar and wind and electrification of light duty vehicles. Um, I'll uh, explain more about that in a second. And then the second of these research frontiers is, is a whole host of non-cost considerations that I think we're really only starting to scratch the surface, but are included in those cross-cutting themes of the workshop that Sonia just showed. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll, I'll make a plug for what's now kind of an old chestnut. And uh, Jay Edmonds was involved in this paper that I led back in 2018. Uh, whose purpose really was to characterize what we thought of as the really difficult sources of emissions to abate. And so although, you know, it's uh, some time has passed and there's some new technologies that have emerged, uh, the sort of core categories of difficult stuff and why they're difficult uh, are still quite relevant. Uh, if you could advance one. Um, you can see that the three buckets, and I'll unpack a little bit, each one of these are highly reliable electricity, which is what we mean by maybe the last 20% of electricity after we have a lot of solar and wind, aviation and long distance uh, transportation and structural materials like cement and steel. Uh, next, please. So uh, to start with the electricity piece, you know, we've said a couple of times solar and wind are cheap now, uh, but their variability, I tell my students, is a little like a hot potato. And so a lot of our research in this uh, field is about who can manage that variability most affordably. Um, you could uh, advance a couple of times here. Yeah, so there, oh, <laughs> there are a few different kind of categories of options for how to manage that variability. You know, in some cases, it may be cheapest to build firm generators or dispatchable generators to back us up, things like the geothermal in the picture here. Um, you might pay people or industries to reduce their demand, or you could build lots of storage or some combination of these. And of course, there's a lot of technologies in each of those buckets to assess. Uh, next, please. So the type of work that we're doing here is really trying to explore the sensitivities of cost-optimized systems 
um, to the availability of different technologies at different price points. And so what you're looking at here is a single simulation that was uh, least cost run that had two types of uh, energy storage, one a lithium ion battery on the bottom and one uh, a generic long duration storage uh, option on the top. And you can see they behave very differently over the course of a year with the battery actually uh, cycling nearly daily, um, whereas the long duration storage charges really gradually for six months and then it's uh, discharged in uh, the hot, uh, less windy days of summer. Next. Sorry for all the animations. I somehow thought I would be the one controlling. So that's electricity. And I think that's the type of work that's going on. On transportation, the real fundamental challenge is energy density. And so you can see here that uh, these two commercial aircraft fueled by fossil jet fuel can travel on the order of 13 or 14,000 kilometers, uh, plenty to get over the Pacific Ocean. Um, if you could go next a couple of times. But if we tried to electrify those things or even use hydrogen, the energy density of those fuel systems is much lower and we would have a very hard time, even with large improvements in the efficiency of the aircraft to get over the ocean in that way in the same uh, type of aircraft. And really it boils down to a fundamental problem of physics that in an internal combustion engine, you're only carrying one of the three reactants, just the fuel, not the air or the exhaust. Whereas in a closed cell battery, you actually have to contain and carry around all of the products and reactants. And so that's always going to be a disadvantage when you're trying to, to uh, travel a long way and have high energy density. Next. So we're going to need energy dense liquid fuels. Uh, these are what are being called sustainable aviation fuels. And there's a lot of different flavors of those actually. The dominant one now is a biofuel that's made from uh, waste oils and fats by a process uh, known as hydroprocessing esters and fatty acids. Um, what you're looking at on the left here is the cost of that fuel. And it's actually in some cases cheap enough, uh, depending on the conversion efficiency and feedstock costs to compete with uh, conventional fossil jet fuel. But if you could press uh, next a couple of times, it's very supply constrained. So there's not a lot of these waste oils. And if we need to start moving towards other types of biofuels, we may run into some environmental problems. Uh, on the other hand, we could synthesize our own jet fuel by uh, using green hydrogen and carbon captured from the air. But as you might imagine, that's still quite expensive and we would need really large cost decreases to compete with fossil fuels. So that's sort of the, the challenge for these sustainable aviation fuels. Next. Lastly, the industrial materials piece and you can press a couple of times here as well. Um, not only do you need really high temperatures, but I think all of us are familiar by now that cement and steel in particular have these process emissions. The chemistry produces CO2. Next. All the way to the next slide. Uh, so some of the work that's going on is to try and figure out how do we actually generate those high temperatures without fossil fuels? Is it hydrogen or electricity or bioenergy? And can we use CCS or some other uh, technology to uh, abate the uh, process-related emissions? Next. And these are just different uh, ways of generating heat. Depending on temperature, we may end up with different technologies. So I would argue all of these are of a type of studies that are looking at these cost-related factors. And you can go one more slide. And a lot of times they're just one-off studies, techno-economic analyses, but you know, in keeping with uh, the workshop goals here, I think it's also important to mention there are these uh, relatively new or emergent over the last decade energy system models that on the one hand are considering, uh, you know, a range of time horizons for decision making and technological detail. You actually just press in uh, maybe five or six times, there's a lot on here. So uh, keep going. Early on, I would say, oh, no, yeah, there you go. So early on, I would say that, you know, electricity dispatch models were developed in order to manage our centralized electricity system, trying to make decisions on the order of hours and days with very detailed information about exactly what generators were involved. On the other end of the spectrum, you had the kind of integrated assessment models that Jay Edmonds uh, has developed in his career, where you were looking out over a century, but relatively sparse detail of technologies in those models. And what's come about in more recent years are kind of a merging of these two energy system models that can resolve hourly dispatch uh, with some detail and actually get out to 2050. Next. 
And so the state of the art here is uh, being developed by a bunch of different groups, these kind of energy system models. But um, one important thing to note on this slide is you see there's some maps. And so increasingly, they're also spatially explicit and they're actually placing infrastructure for the energy transition uh, in, in optimized locations, which brings us to the next point, moving from the cost to the non-cost. So this is just one map from Princeton's uh, Net Zero America report. And I pulled it out just to show how extensive in terms of land area, the infrastructure in this particular net zero scenario is. And if you wanna press again, uh, you know, I think these vast land areas uh, are really important because they have a lot of social, environmental and economic questions that really we've not uh, addressed very well in the past. So when we set aside the least cost situation and start contending with those things, we run into a whole bunch of interesting research questions. Uh, the chart in the lower right is showing the current backlog in capacity waiting to be interconnected to the grid. Uh, this is something that I think many of us wouldn't have expected to be a big challenge, but obviously is. Next. Uh, so a couple other examples of these non-cost factors. Some work my group's doing right now is looking at how air quality and human health differ in net zero scenarios. So depending on how you get to net zero, you can have a different amount of air pollution going on. Uh, the maps on the left are showing uh, PM 2.5 concentrations in a net zero energy system. The top one with a lot of uh, carbon dioxide removal going on and the bottom with not so much. And it stands to reason that if you have a lot of carbon dioxide removal, it's balancing residual CO2 emissions. And those are typically co-emitting uh, pollution. One minute to go. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so when we have these high CDR scenarios, we have a lot more pollution emissions. And if those things are occurring where they have in the past, they're going to be disproportionately in low income and minority areas. So this is uh, an example of some of this work. Uh, lastly, and this is, I think, the last uh, specific research example I was going to give you all uh, came up in the introduction, uh, energy security and trade. So the materials for the uh, renewable electricity and battery systems that we need are distributed very differently than fossil resources around the world. And some work is going on to try to assess what does that mean for national security and energy security. Next. So if you could press a couple more times. Yeah, this is my final slide. And I wanted to kind of summarize that, you know, I do think that solar wind and electrification are uh, clearly going to be important. And I've told you there's these two buckets of research frontiers. One, more cost-related, uh, focusing on those difficult sources of emissions and trying to figure out where should we target our innovation investments or our policies. And another that's really focusing on all of these other factors that are not necessarily cost-related, things like land and water resources, uh, political economy of uh, energy security. I mentioned a whole lot to do with social license, like jobs, environmental justice, NIMBYism, and then co-benefits and trade-offs related to things like air quality I mentioned, or uh, climate resilience. So that's all I had for you today. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, you packed a lot into 10 minutes, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, just remind uh, people that if you have questions, uh, that uh, put them in Slido, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be uh, using that uh, Slido uh, capacity uh, for our Q&A process. Um, so we have a couple already. Uh, we can just take a, a take uh, the first two. Um, the first one uh, says that uh, in the EU, there's an increasing minimum amount of uh, SAFs uh, for airplanes. Uh, do you think this is an effective policy, possibly also for other sustainable solutions as a way of forced scaling up and making it worthwhile to invest in R&D. And I'll just give you the second question uh, so you can uh, take, take them both together. The second question was, can you discuss any relevant advances in satellite imaging and remote sensing, which are facilitating better spatial models for decarbonization and energy systems? Mm, yeah, both really interesting and good questions, which uh, I would expect from the group you have there. Um, I think the the first is actually an open research question. I think it depends on how you craft that policy, how specific it is with regard to the type of SAF and what they define SAF as. Um, 
right now, I think that the federal uh, or the international uh, aviation organization defines SAFs as being 10% better than a fossil counterpart. And so that's actually a pretty minimal improvement in environmental uh, attributes. So a lot still needs to be unpacked about exactly what we mean by that to figure out if it's a good use of our uh, effort. And I think that's a research topic. So uh, on the second point, the spatial um, analysis using satellite data, I think there are a lot of really interesting uh, studies and, and uh, research going on on using satellite data and, and often machine learning in tandem to assess uh, opportunities for expanding the energy system, but also how to manage uh, agriculture and land related emissions that are part of our climate challenge as well. Um, I don't know if I have time to really get into that, but I'd be happy to talk <laughs> offline uh, with whoever asked. Um, I'm, you know, because questions are now beginning to pile up, uh, I think what we'll do is reserve those for the general Q&A uh, uh, because we have uh, more uh, input uh, coming uh, that I think we'll want to, uh, uh, to to be using for the general Q and A session. So uh, with that, let me uh, turn uh, to our second keynote speaker, uh, Nat Bullard. Uh, he's the founder and managing director of Business Climate Limited, a Singapore-based consultancy uh, which is helping global businesses uh, address climate critical decarbonization challenges and the co-founder of Halcyon, an AI-assisted research and information platform focused on the energy transition and decarbonization. Uh, so uh, with that, let me turn the floor uh, over to Nat uh, and uh, uh, looking forward to your remarks. Thank you, Jay. Uh, tough act to follow coming after Steve, but uh, I'll see what I can do. I think actually what I've got here is going to be quite complementary to what Steve has already presented. So why don't we just jump right in? Uh, thank you, uh, Katrina. So I, it's very important to note that the speed with which we're having it, we're, we're, we're making change within the electricity sector as the fastest in absolute terms that's really ever happened. Uh, nuclear power, uh, it, it was and rightly is still viewed as one of the fastest changing elements of decarbonizing uh, a major energy sector. Uh, but the wind, but wind power uh, once past the sort of initiation moment of 100 terawatt hours a year generated is now growing faster than nuclear power did at its fastest growth. Solar uh, is growing faster than nuclear power ever did. Uh, and this is a, a, a healthy tailwind within a key sector for decarbonization, which is the electricity sector. Next one, please. It's also important to note that we're drafting in many cases off of not, not just this century, but the previous century worth of innovation on long timelines in terms of improving capability within the materials that make up key bits of energy transition and decarbonization. So I really enjoy this. This is data from RMI that shows you the improvements in energy density of batteries and a sort of slow walk up through uh, through almost an entire century before we start to rapidly gap up in the world of the lithium ion battery with advances to come uh, that really are revolutionary. They're not, to Steve's point, something that are yet gonna get us to the point of long haul aviation powered by batteries. But they have implications for thinking about all kinds of mode of transport, uh, energy storage within the grid, uh, and new new markets that will be incepted, I think, by lower cost and higher energy density. Next one, please. Steve also alluded to the, the cost position in, in the PV sector. We have 50 years of data now. And it's very nice to look into it and see a 99% decrease in real terms in the in the PV module price per watt. Uh, it's more like only 90% improvement over the last uh, decade or so. This is also in a context of a, a greatly improved product, something that in and of itself is much more efficient than it was years ago, something that's increasingly durable. And I think important to note that right now, at least within the 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 current sort of boundaries of the photovoltaic sector as it is, we don't really have limits to manufacturing scale at the moment. Uh, we're going to do almost 600 gigawatts of installed solar this year, which is a pretty extraordinary number. Uh, almost all of the value chain could manufacture double that much within a year or two if needed. Next, please. All of these things actually flow 
through capital. Uh, money is the channel that actually makes a lot of decarbonization happen. You're talking about fixed assets for which the fuel, so to speak, is oftentimes capital financing over a long period of time. Uh, it was actually uh, Lord Brown, the former uh, the former CEO of BP, who actually said a quote at one of the first conferences I ever attended that the biggest change you're seeing is you move from a fossil fuel fired system to a or fossil fuel energized system to a renewable one is that you're trading operating expenditure for capital expenditure. Uh, and if you look at that swap, you can see it here. Uh, we now have more investment in clean energy that's including transportation than in fossil fuel extraction or fossil fuel fired power generation. Uh, add in the grids that go with it, and there's about $2 trillion worth of capital flow a year now into these channels that are doing decarbonization. And if I could see the next one, we're also coming close to a moment in which renewable power, or really just wind and solar, is able to meet the marginal demand growth of electricity. I will caution this by saying that I think this is a paradigm that is actually going to be challenged at a moment when at a moment when we would love for it to become the dominant paradigm that, that renewable power has become the main way to decarbonize the electricity sector and that that decarbonized electricity then goes on to decarbonize other things other processes and other industries but you'll see in a moment uh where there may be some inherent challenge within that next please one thing to be very aware of in the transportation sector, and this has implications not just for emissions, for materials use, for consumption of fuels, for trade, but for economic policy and competitiveness amongst nations, is that uh, we really have hit the peak manufacturing moment for the internal combustion engine, at least in the passenger car sector. Uh, the peak, in fact, happened in 2017. We're now close to a decade past the peak in terms of how many internal combustion engine vehicles were manufactured in a year. Electric vehicles were 18% of total uh, cars sold last year. They'll be closer to 25% this year. But to put it another way, the only growth in the auto sector is now coming from the world's electric vehicles. Uh, we're not really in a situation in which the internal combustion engine fleet is going to monotonically grow, or the fleet will grow rather, but the the supply that is coming into market will not be monotonically growing uh, anytime soon, and I would say not forever. But let's go ahead, next slide, and I want to talk about some of the things that are a little bit headwind, if we will. The first is a return to demand growth in electricity, in particular in the United States in a way that I think we're just sort of coming to wrestle with. Uh, this is data on the, the sort of rolling 10-year compound annual uh, average growth rate forecast for electricity load in the US. A couple of things to note here. I, I enjoyed this chart, which was unfortunately quite a lot of manual work to put together, but it points to a, a world in which we thought we had a higher growth than we actually did for years. We expected higher growth. We're now expecting growth rising again. There are gaps in the data that thus my little friend here for 2012, where there was no data put in. But we're we're past the point where we can say that, yes, we'll just decarbonize electricity because electricity demand is not growing. We can just renewable our way out of it. Next one, please. We have some demand drivers, such as, for instance, uh, d data consumption processing, AI uh, model training, AI inference, uh, all of which are leading to a data center boom that has real legs behind it. Uh, the world's data centers now consume more power than the UK. We're looking at we're looking at particular installations that will breach 500 megawatts these years or a gigawatt in the future in terms of discrete places. That's a lot of focused demand in one place to address with supply, which is uh, an opportunity to do renewable power. It's also an opportunity in the future to do things like in geothermal or, or even some particular kind of nuclear applications. But it's a demand that needs to be met at the same time that we need more power to decarbonize everything else, as Steve so aptly alluded to. Next one, please. We And we have, uh, to put it in a sort of glib fashion, we have to move from physics problems in power to chemistry problems in everything else. And solving those, solving those is really challenging. I'm very glad, and especially for this of all audiences, will know very well what Steve mentioned that you cannot magic away emissions from making cement. 
like it's actually a matter of the it's it's a matter of the chemistry as it currently exists. So it's not the same thing as swapping in electrons of a of a clean variety. Um, where we have kind where we have approaches to decarbonization, they're all over the place. You know, uh, some sometimes it's electrification, sometimes it's CCUS. Sometimes efficiency is going to be the big thing that's going to that's going to reach uh, emissions from emissions changes, but that that's not guaranteed. And these are all a bit hand wavy because this is all about the long term future. I've got three more slides, and I'll make sure to get them all in. The next one, again, to allude to aviation, is that we have quite a lot of development of the volume of sustainable aviation fuel. And it looks like it's pretty much going to almost quadruple, or at least more than triple this year is the estimate in terms of supply, which will gap supply up to somewhere under half a percent or somewhere, sorry, a little bit over one half of a percent of the total share of jet fuel. And that's already in, a, in an environment where you have challenges as far as how much of that uh, how much of that can be done with conventional processes and not only it, or one at minute price like how much can a, a compliance market bear it one minute jay or how am i doing yeah one minute okay i've got two last slides the first is that and again steve alluded to cc is ccs and c and and i think it's important that we look at it as very much in the realm of potential this is some excellent work from oxford and remember, these are only studies, techno-economic estimates of costs that have been generally increasing over the last two decades. And this isn't even stuff that has been deployed in the field. So you know, for, for every sort of magicking up of, of CCS or CCUS as a solution, I would caution us about the economics that are actually implied within that. And my final slide is that, you know, we are or we should be having a, a global context conversation here. We've had some success in the US and the EU in peaking our emissions, uh, but China emits now more than the US and the EU 27 combined. India will soon probably emit more than the EU does. And then there's an entire other part of the world that emits more pretty much than both of them put together than India and China and about twice as much, or at least 50% as much than, uh, than what the US and the EU together emit. So we have we have challenges to solve uh, that are global in scale, but have local manifestations, if you will. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great job. Uh, both of you guys getting a lot of really valuable information out there on the table. Um, and I think we now transition to our uh, our open Q and A for this session. So uh, I've got. Uh, the Slido in front of me, and we have uh, a, a set of uh, excellent questions. Uh, and I'll start with the first of these, uh, which while it's directed to Steve, I think could be uh, addressed by both speakers. Uh, and it has to do with hydrogen. And it uh, says, uh, what fraction of final energy use do you think will come from green hydrogen uh, as we approach net zero? And I think I would add to that, um, what, uh, who will be using it, and uh, and is green hydrogen going to be the only source uh, for hydrogen in the net zero economy? Yeah, do you want to go first, Nat? Or I'm happy to take that first. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. my 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 take on this is that is that I I view a lot of what happens in hydrogen right now as essentially. Uh, industrial policy masquerading as masquerading as a climate strategy. Um, there, there, which is to say that there, there is a huge apparatus, and, I, and this is a neutral statement. There's a huge apparatus that manufactures and moves or transforms and moves molecules that sees a molecular solution at, at, at hand. Uh, that is that is something that is beguiling, I think, in a lot of ways, and is and would be very welcome within the world's kind of petrochemical uh, and molecular complex, if you will. To put it to put it in a sort of spare way, I think the the challenge that I would ask to look ahead is what will be the competing option. Like a lot of these things assume this sort of you know uh, uh, the molecule is universal carrier will be constantly transformed along the way into or out of another carrier molecule. It will be a source of primary energy and combustion, or it will go into other processes where it's transformed. 
What might be competing along the way with that? I think the challenge, especially wherein these things have sort of mega projects, economics behind them, is to keep a clear eye as to what the competing option is. It, the competing option may not be petro, may not be uh, a petrochemical option. It may not be a chemical option at all. It may be electrification. So I would urge, I would urge also that there's wherein these assets have very long planning cycles. Uh, they're competing with things that are moving constantly. The the, the cost of stored energy and batteries, uh, the cost of delivered electrons uh, generated by wind or solar. But I'll leave it at that. I see I see Steve nodding along, so I think he's probably got something to add. Yeah, I mean, I'll be brief because I know you've probably got a long list of questions, Jay. I, I totally agree with what Nat said. I think, you know, will we be making a lot of hydrogen to the scale that we currently burn natural gas? I think the answer to that is is pretty clearly no, or at least I would be shocked. Um, but there are some real advantages to hydrogen in certain applications, uh, whether it's for feedstocks like the sustainable aviation fuels or because it's um, you know something that really can link the electricity and transport sectors if you're making fuels, but you're then using some of the hydrogen to store energy. So the kind of systems integration advantage is there. These are things that might mean that there's a real role for green hydrogen going forward, but it's still pretty expensive. And I think it's a, an open question how much of it we'll be using. Great. Um, so uh, the next question is also a very interesting question. Uh, it has to do uh, with uh, transition strategies. And, and it, it, the question is, what's your perspective on low carbon solutions like natural gas in the next phase of the energy transition. Um, Let's go I for that first. <laughs> I can briefly remark on that. I'm sure Nat will have things too. Um, I, I think, you know, fossil natural gas, uh, the, the way that you would imagine using that with CCS, um, it seems to me like my gut is that that's not going to win, that we have other ways of uh, handling the variability that's going to come with renewables. And that the lowest cost options probably not going to be a network of natural gas CCS facilities. Um, there are other places that we might use that occasionally, like a little bit of that could really help to balance uh, some of the variability unabated if you have CDR to offset it, for example, um, because the last 1% of electricity reliability is sometimes really difficult to meet depending on where you are. Um, but I don't think it's going to be anywhere near the scale it's being used now. Totally agree with what Steve says in terms of that last one percent solving these pro solving these problems that are a, a literally a quick start problem in the power sector is, would be extraordinarily expensive and difficult to do, and the economics of simply making a decision to offset that with a high quality carbon dioxide wow. removal offset not necessarily at the flu by the way not necessarily at the asset mouth uh, you know is is something that I think we should we should bear in mind. I will also want to sort of distinguish natural gas in the power sector from natural gas and petrochemical applications. Uh, there, I think there's quite a bit of difference. But I will say in the power sector, I think that the big challenge is going to be that the economics of power generation in most of the world outside of the United States is likely to be a competition between renewable generation and coal. That's certainly the way that the economics align in East Asia, almost everywhere. And the we will see an increasing sort of squeeze on on gas as a, you know, a, on gas in within the power merit order in these markets. Uh, also, I want to caution that we're going to have an awful lot of gas sloshing around the world in ships in a couple of years' time based on the LNG buildup that is coming. And those molecules tend to find a way, you know, they, they, they will find, a, life finds a way, so to speak, uh, but they will find a way to get to get into some kind of productive productive use, leaving the climate implications aside. So the economics of that may become you know may, may become cheaper again than than people are expecting now. But it's not. I but I don't think that we'll have the role that we that you see in the United States as a model for the rest of the world. Thanks. Um, so the questions just keep coming. Uh, th That's the good. next one. Uh, and they're all really interesting questions. Uh, the next one uh, really uh, has to do with the interplay between the technology improvements that you've outlined uh, and their rate of improvement. Uh, but are they coming fast enough? Is the, see, we have someone who has 
their mic on. Hello, sorry. Um, can people in the room please remember to keep your computers muted? Great. Uh, thank you. So, uh, as I said, the uh, the the next one is uh, kind of how are we doing? Uh, is the rate at which the technologies are improving, uh, and the rate at which uh, we are deploying uh, non-emitting technologies. Um, how does that compare to the way that we're eating through uh, our carbon budget uh, for meeting goal of mid-century net zero? Yeah, I, I'll be very quick, Nat, and then you can correct me. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we're we're behind. Uh, short to put it short, um, you know, we we're still increasing global emissions, for example, year on year, um, not not a lot by about one percent the last couple of years, but you know we should be going down to follow some of the the mid century net zero trajectories. So that alone is a pretty good indication that we need to be deploying this stuff faster. We're devouring our carbon budget, to put it very plainly. Uh, and each year of plateaued emissions uh, just makes it that much harder to abate later on uh, and, and makes the raises the questions about removing tech, carbon from the atmosphere actively uh, more salient. So my, my take on the, like, how are we doing on technology improvements is a very reductive cost-driven one, not efficiency-driven one. So rather than sort of rather than focusing on the the sort of ideal efficiencies that you might be reaching from technologies, focus more on the cost of the delivered whatever it is. You know, uh, it, you, there are some intriguing implications of very very inexpensive solar that do not require a thirty five percent conversion efficiency to work. What they actually require is a very very low capital cost. And thinking about thinking about a very low capital cost plus a very abundant supply chain, and what that is as an improvement, and it's not what you think of sort of scientifically as an improvement. It's not. It didn't get better because it became fifty percent more efficient. It became it became better because it became fifty percent less costly, and uh, that that's a dynamic that you will see in any of the highly distributed technologies that we have very bluntly wind, solar, and batteries. Where we're less likely to see it is in the mega projects type of pro type of things. In the world's first hydrogen hub, I will wager now, will not be on time or on budget. Okay, it will, it will, it, it will, it will follow mega project economics, meaning that it'll be laid and it'll be co more costly than it was anticipated. That doesn't mean it's impossible. The best way to work through that is to do 50 more of them, except that that's the beginning of a process not the terminus of one. But at the same time, it's in the context of competing against things that are, are will be shipped in the billions. We shipped, I think the world shipped about a billion PV modules last year, which is pretty extraordinary. That's a lot. And I can't even think of how many batteries we shipped, depending on, on what your lens on batteries is. Is it the, the cell, the pack, the device level we shipped? I can't even tell you how many batteries last year. If I could just tack on one thing, Jay, I think Nat, Nat's example of uh, sort of less efficient but low capital cost solar is exactly the kind of thing that energy system models can help us identify as a priority for future deployment. And so it's not something that a bench chemist is going to go after unless we tell them, hey, this is what the world really needs. So, And I appreciate the models that, it, that you know, modeling with that as a, mo a modality essentially like or a, a toggle within the model is really important to think about but this this is a almost a matter of cognition more than it is of anything else it's a way of thinking that i would urge people to at least explore uh regardless of what your your particular focus is i think it's it's fairly tested that this is that these types of technologies work in these ways uh, but it can be challenging if it's if it's not if it's not something that you expect. Let's put it that way. So we've got five minutes left in this session, and a really interesting question is at the top of the Slido queue, um, and that is, uh, what would your policy priorities be for the next five to ten years? Uh, and I'm going to ask you to. Uh, identify whether these are for the United States as a whole 
for individual states, for Europe, for Southeast Asia, and where are we talking about? Uh, but the next five to 10 years, what are the policy priorities? I've been jumping in first, Nat, so you go for it. <laughs> I'll do the U.S. Uh, because I, I, I think it's actually not possible to give a uh, to give a thorough answer beyond any one sort of jurisdiction. For the United States, I would say do as much as you possibly can on the positive side of the ledger. <laughs> do every bit of decarbonization technology you can that works right now at a volume that you, that would challenge your prior expectations, just as today's reality will tr would very much challenge the prior expectations of before. Set a policy goal that we should have a terawatt of solar in the U.S. by the year twenty by the year twenty thirty five. Well, that sounds can I crackers. Just push but it's you not. a little bit further uh, because yeah. those are goals. Um, mm -hmm. They're not policies. Um, could you? I mean, and you don't have to answer this, um, but do you have a policy recommendation? So I was get I was getting there, Jay. Uh, oh, what I would good, say good, is, good, if good. the new stuff, right. the market will take care of that. Set a goal, and a, the market will take care of that, provided you have policies that say make it faster to interconnect, allow us to build bulk transmission in particular. For the newer technologies, let's revive something from the from the the, the proto history of the solar industry, which is the block buy. You know, the reason that solar took off in the United States was because of the government's block buying capability, committing to buy which was a policy decision, uh, various technologies at various states along the way that gave industries enough roadmap to play into until the block buys got canceled and then the industry went away. So I would say once you've done them, try to make them durable, but uh, I will yield the rest of my time so Steve can get in a word here. Steve, bring us home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think Nat mentioned something that was on my mind, which is the sort of practical hurdles and bottlenecks that are preventing us from going faster on the, the deployment of solar and wind in particular. So policy changes that could help us uh, clear that interconnection queue, uh, support the expansion of transmission, um, help to accelerate the actual getting the solar uh, on the ground. Um, would be wonderful. Uh, I think it's uh, it's carefully done. It needs to be carefully done in order to to sustain that for decades in the future. But to me, that's a big priority. Um, also, for the sort of really difficult stuff that we've been talking about, some of these like cement and steel type things. I think anything the government can do to enhance the lead markets for those kinds of things, where they can de-risk the development of a green steel uh, plant. Uh, by having a ready market that that we know will buy the product of that plant could really accelerate the deployment of some of those technologies. Well, I could listen to these two speakers for the rest of the day. <laughs> but unfortunately, we've scheduled another session. So let me just uh, thank both of those speakers uh, for some really insightful work. And turn the floor over to um, uh, my colleagues, uh, Wei Peng uh, and Mark Hafstead, uh, who will take us into uh, the transition session. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Mark Hafstead, and I'm on the organizing committee for uh, this workshop my, uh, with Wei Peng, who is also uh, on the organizing committee. And so um, we are here to talk about the 
Um, economic risks and opportunities of decarbonization this session. Um, so this panel discussion will hear from experts on economic risks and opportunities of decarbonization. Uh, we've defined risk as potential scenarios where things can go wrong with an assessment of uncertainty. As we discuss decarbonization, these can include both transition risks, such as those caused by the transition on finance, labor, supply chains, and the political economy, and also derailment risks, or risks that socioeconomic challenges could derail the transition. So logistically, um, we're gonna have four speakers. Uh, we're gonna have two in person and two virtual. Um, and we are going to, they're gonna be five minute flash talks and I'll give a one minute verbal cue before the time is up. And uh, once all the speakers have gone, we're gonna have about 40 minutes for a larger group Q and A. Um, so if you do have a question at any time, uh, as we did in the previous session, please submit them via Slido and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can uh, during our discussion. Um, so our first speaker and speakers who are in person, if you could come up to the, uh, the lecture lectern uh, when you give your presentation. Um, so we're gonna start with Adele, Adele Morris. Uh, she's a senior advisor in the Division of Financial Stability at the Board of Governors of, at the uh, Federal Reserve Board, which is right next door to us. Hi, Adele. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good to meet you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks to the organizing committee. Terrific agenda today. I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm a senior advisor in the Division of Financial Stability at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And uh, my work involves incorporating climate change into our financial stability framework at the board. I want to emphasize that my remarks are just my views. I'm not speaking for the board or any of the individual governors of the board or the Federal Reserve System. You're stuck with just my personal opinions, um, but I, I, hope, uh, I hope to contribute. So as Sonia described at the beginning, we have risks and we have barriers. And she talked about the barriers to climate progress. And in the economics climate literature, We've looked at all sorts of potential barriers that stakeholders, um, policymakers might be concerned about in uh, adopting climate policies. And that can be the economic consequences, the distributional outcomes on households or individual industries, what happens to trade exposed energy intensive firms if we act more unilaterally, all of those things, including what happens to coal reliant communities, social and economic outcomes that might be of concern. And the good news is there's a huge body of literature that many of us, including myself and Mark and others, um, looking at those various impediments and looking for policy design solutions that can ameliorate concerns about those outcomes. I think of these as fairly straightforward to project outcomes and the policy design tools that the literature has developed and, and people are still working on, I think can give comfort to policymakers that they are certainly gonna do more benefit than harm by addressing the climate challenge. Now risks, I wanna use an unofficial, uneconomic way of, of characterizing risks, but I sort of think of it as something that's low probability, but potentially quite high cost and relatively hard to predict, right? Like what are those outcomes that are possibly gonna come from left field? They might um, start in one part of the economy or the financial sector and be transmitted or amplified like we might see in a financial crisis. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're looking at these risks um, at the Federal Reserve and other financial regulators. We've got a committee within our Financial Stability Oversight Council that's grappling with climate change, both physical damages of climate change, but also transition risks as well. And um, so just talking a little bit from the perspective of financial regulators, recognizing this is one part of the challenge, obviously the macro economy and the social human health and environmental outcomes are incredibly important. But looking at our corner of, of the challenge, we have kind of two thrusts that are very aligned with our mandate. One is through our supervision and regulation perspective. That's looking at individual financial institutions and their safety and solvency in the event of various kinds of shocks, right? So this is 
is a bank in good condition to withstand various kinds of shocks, could be a, a recession, a, a drop in housing prices. We do these stress tests and we've got a whole system of regulatory approaches and methods. And we're just starting into thinking through um, supervisory aspects of the climate challenge. I work in a different part and financial stability is looking at the system as a whole, right? Not just one institution, but how, like I said, we could have some kind of contagion from one part of the financial system to another that you know carries those external costs. Ed Dell, you have one minute. Okay. And so what we're doing is using macroeconomic modeling where there's that sectoral disaggregation to think through how various futures might play out, scenarios, narratives, quantifying them, putting them in models, looking at those projections, and then mapping those sectoral projections to the sectors we know banks and others have interests in because we have data on balance sheets. So we look at how those balance sheets might be adjusted as a result of these shocks, and then construct summary statistics and metrics that we can monitor over time. That's kind of the gist of some of our analytical work. We're trying to bring the data to the question. There are a lot of scenarios, a lot of modeling that we need to undertake, but that's kind of a flavor for what we're doing. And um, I'm happy to um, talk more about this. I could talk about it all day. Um, and I look forward to everyone else's remarks. <laughs> Thanks, Adele. Um, our uh, next speaker is going to be virtual, uh, Christina Panasco. Uh, she is an associate professor in public policy at the Department of Politics and, and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she is currently on leave and is a senior research economist at the Center for Climate Change of the Banque de France. Thanks so much, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. And. Uh, Will you share the slides or should I proceed? Because I don't feel I can share the slides, the participant. Okay, fantastic. I'm seeing that you are now um, showing the slides. So if you can proceed, that would be great. Thanks so much. In the meantime, I will just highlight, as uh, Adele has mentioned, that these are just my views. Uh, it doesn't represent the views of the Bank de France uh, at all. And uh, that actually this is part of the work of my previous life as an academic at the, at the University of Cambridge and some of the projects that I, that I participated. So I will talk a little bit about, uh, we were provided you know, a couple of questions. I will talk a little bit about the one on how can climate policy design actually overcome difficulties, overcome the risk and, and transform the trade-offs that we can see in policy into uh, opportunities. Um, it's well known that the current, uh, the current implementation of policies remains off track of gathering the, the goals or of uh, achieving the goals of the, of the Paris Agreement. Emissions uh, are still out of, uh, of, out of track. And this has strengthened the idea that we need better policies, that we need policies that are better designed, not only to overcome the environmental uh, problems, but also to keep track of other issues associated to socioeconomic problems, socioeconomic concerns uh, that might uh, actually dif make more difficult the implementation of these policies uh, in the society. I don't know if you have read the, the report of Mario Draghi and the, and the European Commission that has been published two, three days ago. And actually, this is one of the things that uh, Draghi is reinforcing. You know, the idea that we have the environmental goals, but we also have other goals. Next slide, please. So I will try to tentatively answer that question. And I have highlighted climate policy and opportunities. I'm sorry, I think you need to click a little bit more because I did it in different uh, steps. Okay, perfect, that's it. So this is part of a work that I published with my colleagues in Nature Climate Change a couple of years ago. We uh, investigated, it's a systematic literature review, we investigated the different outcomes and trade-offs and uh, opportunities of a set of uh, 10 environmental, or we call the carbonization policy instruments in different outcomes, not only environmental effectiveness, which was the most relevant one, but also technological effectiveness, innovation, competitiveness, and distributional issues. What you see in the slides is the effects that we uh, found for three 
uh, instruments in particular. We investigated, as I said, 10 energy taxes, uh, GAG emission trading systems, and I added here as a last one, feeding tariffs. And one of my first remarks is that we should think of climate policy as a wider set of policies and not only as the uh, carbon pricing mechanisms that always well, the central banks and financial institutions have in mind. There is a whole bunch of instruments. Uh, the analysis that we performed, uh, you can see that there were ex-ante evaluations and exposed evaluations that we included, gives a very positive and optimistic uh, view of the environmental out outcomes we are achieving with implementation of policies, and also, to some extent, with the technological effectiveness. When I say environmental effectiveness, I'm talking here about uh, reduction in emission, reduction in energy consumption, and technological effectiveness will be the deployment of these new technologies, cleaner technologies that we need to advance in our decarbonization effort. However, next slide, please. When we move towards more, a uh, little bit more, uh, one or two clicks, oh, another click, please. Thank you very much. One, the previous one. When we move towards uh, outcomes more related to competitiveness, uh, when I say competitiveness, we are talking about GDP loss, uh, losses, we might be talking about loss of competitiveness in firms, uh, and distributional impacts, and here I will focus a little bit more on impacts on households and the different income groups, the picture changes. You see a lot of orange here, before it was blue, which is positive impacts, now you see more negative impacts. And these negative impacts tend to be mixed. So there are, for example, in terms of competitiveness, a lot of divergences in the literature that we know comes from the design of the different policies. So these divergences that you see, there are some no impacts, there are negative impacts, for feeding tariffs we have positive, negative, and no impacts in the implementation of policies. This comes from the real design of the policies behind. For example, in terms of carbon pricing mechanism, what we see is that those policies that have been implemented with recycling mechanisms in certain ways reinforces, thank you, reinforces positive impacts while without mechanisms that compensate for those costs, there are certain groups or certain sectors that might suffer. Next slide, please. So I will finish uh, soon. So how to overcome these trade-offs? Because we need to take into consideration all the goals in order to actually implement these policies in an effective way. Well, with a project that was financed by the UK government, and I think some of the members of the audience as well uh, were involved in this, in this project, we developed this set of 10 uh, principles for policy making in the energy transition that kind of move from the traditional economic uh, advice that we've received when we think about marginal change, equilibrium, and so on, to a set of principles that take more into consideration the structural change that we need for this transition. And here we are talking about things like technology choices need to be made, as Stephen before mentioned that we need to, um, uh, to finance different type of innovation. Combine policies for better outcome, very important. Policy adaptation, um, policy adapt policies should be adaptive. Sorry, um, we need to coordinate internationally to grow technology markets and so on and so forth. So these principles might help us overcome the trade-offs that I just mentioned. And just the last slide, please. Just to sum up. As I said, I think models need a better representation of policies, not only uh, carbon pricing mechanism, but other type of policies that have been improved uh, essentially in the transition to decarbonized economies. We need to take into consideration empirical insights as well and compare what the evidence says when we do modeling exercises versus when we evaluate policies once they have been put in place. We need to Christina, can you just adequately wrap up very this, quickly. Yes, adequately design the policies and following the last question that was uh, made before there is not a one fits all approach and policy success depend on the design and the uh, implementation in the jurisdiction itself thank you thank you um our next speaker is also going to be virtual uh johannes strobel is the david s uh Loeb professor of finance at nyu stern school of business and a uh I went to graduate school with him at Stanford. Great, thank you very much for having me. So I was asked to provide some um, comments and thoughts on the macroeconomic risks um, from decarbonization. And on the next slide, 
Um, I sort of summarized so the various channels through which uh, decarbonization policies might affect the macroeconomy. So one big category that we often think and worry about is through the effect on potentially higher energy prices and inflation, um, which can affect the macroeconomy and therefore uh, cause various types of risks that might even end up in the financial sector, as Adele mentioned in the beginning. Um, but we also think about stranded assets for traditional energy firms. You know, if we basically put them out of business, either because we, you know, we, we tax the uh, carbon emissions or we, you know, provide very you know, low cost and um, renewable energy, um, there's a concern that, um, you know, they might end up defaulting on their loans, um, that there's sort of large regional reallocation that happens when employment declines in regions where we currently produce, you know, hydrocarbon energy, um, et cetera. So those are the various types of channels that we think about when we think about, you know, the transition risks from decarbonization. But I think one kind of key point that I want to make on this first slide is that achieve different decarbonization policies might end up having very, very different effects. So two types of policies that you could broadly consider as part of the decarbonization organization toolkit. One of them is just restrictions on drillings, uh, on current drilling, restrictions on pipeline building, and also just carbon taxes by themselves. Those would be um, types of policies that would actually end up increasing energy prices and inflation. So they would work through that uh, top channel here. On the other hand, policies such as just subsidies to renewables would actually lead to lower energy prices and lower inflation. And so the first point that I want to make is that the risks are not necessarily the risks of decarbonization per se, but the different ways of achieving decarbonization will end up having a very, very different macro risk profile. And so I think we want to think about the policies as having differential risk rather than decarbonization, which is really the objective that the various types of policies want to achieve. Um, can we go uh, next slide? And even one more. Um, the second point that I want to make, if we think about sort of, you know, risks from sort of various types of decarbonization policies, but I want to highlight that there's also quite substantial risks from decarbonization policy uncertainty. Um, this comes from a, from a recent research paper that we published where we worked with um, data from the European emissions trading schemes and options on the carbon allowances in that scheme to come up with a market-based measure of carbon price uncertainty at the daily frequency. And so you see a plot here and you see that there's a lot of time variation in how uncertain firms are about future carbon prices. And a lot of that is driven by policy. And what we could then show is that in periods where there was more carbon price uncertainty and there were substantial declines in firms' decarbonization investments. So when firms don't know which way this is going to go, carbon prices might be high, they might be low, nobody really knows. Um, they just stop doing anything. You know, in economics, we call this the real option theory, right? Once you invest, you can't take the money back. So if you don't know if you know the investment's going to pay off or not, why not wait another year to figure out where carbon prices are going to end up? And so I think a key risk as we think about decarbonization um, uh, policies is actually the uncertainty that you know firms want certainty, whether or not the carbon price is high or low. In some sense, they don't care; they just want to know what it is, and that they can then sort of adjust their investments and 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 can you know and and work with that. And so I think that's a really important point. Quantitatively, I want to highlight that, you know, the, the, the these sort of swings in uncertainty about future carbon prices that you see here have the same effect on decarbonization policies as, you know, order of magnitude, 15, 20 euro movements in the expected carbon price, the level of the, the, the midpoint, right? So these are quantitatively hugely important um, effects. And I just think we haven't thought about it enough that, you know, sometimes it might be better to go for something slightly less ambitious and gives firms certainty and get them to start investing today rather than kind of aim for an extremely aggressive policy that we can't get done and then just leave them with a lot of uncertainty because we don't see any action on the firm side from that perspective. Um, two more thoughts on the last slide. Um, the the first one um, is you know the session is is I think rightly and the workshops rightly focused to think about you know various types of financial risk from decarbonization but I think we shouldn't lose sight of yeah, the fact honestly, that you have one minute perfect that the flip side of that is the avoided financial risks. Um, from less climate change that we have when we do decarbonization. So as we think about the macro risks, et cetera, that come from decarbonization, not doing decarbonization is equally risky, potentially even more risky. Just think about housing markets, insurance markets, et cetera. So we could have a whole session on that. I think we don't want to lose sight of that. Um, I think the other problem is kind of this eternal challenge that we always have, which is when you think about risks from decarbonization, you realize that country by country, the risks are largely domestic, while the benefits are often largely global. 
right? And so this is the typical externality argument that would lead to an underinvestment in decarbonization. And so I think what's really, really important is to design decarbonization policies to maximize the domestic opportunities that also come alongside that. And I think other panelists will talk about that and we'll talk about that in the panel. Because if, the, if we just say the benefits are largely captured by China and Europe and everywhere else, but all the costs are here in the US, I think we're just going to struggle getting political buy-in. Um, I think the other thing that we just need to realize, and I think this is just a political reality, is that decarbonization strategies with very large negative macro effects, so decarbonization strategies that lead to high energy prices, for example, are just unlikely to be implemented. Right? I don't think any policymaker going out says, yes, we're going to stop carbon emissions. Most of the benefits go to the rest of the world. And, you know, your gas prices are going to double as a result. We're just not going to see that. That's the reason why we don't have a carbon tax. It's also why the IRA like largely works with carrots rather than sticks. And so I think what we need to do is we need to think about, you know, investments in renewable energy and R&D and so on, also as investments to allow future policymakers to be in a position where they can then implement um, other policies without raising energy prices. I just think any path that leads to high energy prices will not be a path that will be chosen. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Johannes. Um, and now we are going to move uh, to our final speaker, last but not least, uh, Heather Boucher. Um, she is a member of President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors and Chief Economist to the Investing in America Cabinet. So I have a slide, but I actually want to um, I want to riff a little bit on what people said. So I'm actually not going to refer to the slides. So you can keep it up, not keep it up, whatever. It's nice. It's a great slide. Um, so I actually think that where Johannes ended is exactly the point that I wanted to convey to you all today. Um, as um, as was just noted, uh, I'm a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. I'm also the chief economist for his Invest in America cabinet. And you know, when I think about what the um, president and vice president have done over this term here in the United States, this has been about addressing the political economy risks of getting something across the finish line and really focused on um, front loading those sets of questions. Often when I hear people talk about uh, climate policy, there is this sort of one-two punch, oh, we can do this one thing, but then we're going to need to help people on the back end. And this, our approach was, nope, we're going to do one big punch, and it's going to make sure that the help for people and families and communities and businesses is a part of the package from the get-go, um, because, uh, because we believe that was the only way to get something um, that could be politically a um, tractable to get across the finish line, but it is fundamentally um, about reducing risk. So let me just go through a couple of the key ways. And five minutes is not enough time to say almost anything. So bear with me. But I want to go through just a couple of the key ways that we really thought deeply and have been implementing on how to reduce risk for all of the various stakeholders and participants as we transition to the clean energy economy. So First, of course, there is a series of subsidies and tax credits and uh, support across the innovation to commercialization pipeline. A lot of it is about de-risking capital, making it possible for a good idea to actually get to commercialization at scale. Um, I've been visiting a lot of these businesses all across the country, and that's what you hear time and time again is can um, you know support with uh, questions like offtake agreements, like we've done in um, we're starting to do in hydrogen, or thinking about how to help firms get the capital they need so that they can then start up and so then they can be a part of this um, sector has been just absolutely critical. And then in terms of durability and these questions about uncertainty, those tax credits for the most part all last a decade. And while I think many of us believe that this was a second best solution, I actually think that there's a lot of research to be done about how this actually might have been the first best if you actually think that addressing the political economy questions needs to be core of your solution. Because the announced investments that we've seen, which to now in the United States total $910 billion, have disproportionately gone to lower income communities, communities in the bottom half of the income distribution, communities where people are less likely to have a college degree. That is something that we've all been trying to do at the national level for a long time, do economic development that pulls the country together, that addresses these gaps. And actually by telling firms, hey, we'll give you a tax credit, but you know what? The tax credit will be bigger if you do that investment in low income community, low income community. bigger if you make that investment in a fossil fuel energy community. Actually, businesses said, wow, 
okay, you know what, we can do that. And we're actually seeing this, um, the shovels in the ground are going in those communities. So connecting the dots in our policies, solving the risk problem for the firm and the firm's uncertainty, but then also solving the uncertainty problem for the community, I think is part of the way that we have thought about that. Um, and so the second big thing that we've, I mean, there's a bunch of things we tried to do, but in five minutes, I wanted to just focus on two with um, one other point, which is that uh, the second thing we've really focused on is making sure that we're thinking about the workforce development issues. Um, I am a labor economist by training, and I find the idea that we're talking about clean energy and we say the word labor shortages to be a little bit of a, it, like, it, oh, it hurts my ears. Because it's not that we have a shortage of humans that are ready to work. We have a shortage of the connective tissue between the new businesses. And as all the tech people know, these are new businesses, new ideas. They have new ways of doing things. They need to help the community colleges, the universities, the workforce development systems understand what kinds of workers they need and convince that community that if I go into that field, this is a career for me, right? That's what people need. Workers don't just magically appear. They need all of those other things. That's a big risk. And our policies, we've really been trying to put that front and center. We always have, I think, needed more budget space to do more of that. Um, but that has been a second way we've thought about risk. The final thing I want to say in my last 40 seconds here is as I look out on the, the risks um, for the future, and one of the reasons that I have just, it has been a joy, such a joy to be able to participate in this workshop, um, this one and the other ones that we've had, and thank you to the National Academy of Sciences for all of your work here and everyone who's worked on this. But one of the big issues facing the United States, um, and I think other countries around the world coming down the pipeline, is the lack of fiscal space to either continue to do this kind of work in the United States and for other countries to do it. If we think this is a successful policy model, how do we think about creating that fiscal space to do that? And what is the role of our macroeconomic models, our economic assumptions, and helping to show the benefits of investing big now and solving those risks versus the longer term climate damages that we are also aware of? So um, thank you so much. And I really look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you to all four of our uh, speakers um, for, for the remarks. Um, I'm going to take moderator prerogative to start with a few questions before we get into the Slido, although I think some of the Slido questions are related to some of my questions, so I'll try to combine them maybe a little bit. Um, so Johannes talked about policy uncertainty, um, and I'm really interested in that, and I know that your, um, your presentation focused on uncertainty in like the future ETS price and investments in, uh, in, in companies in Europe facing that price. But we have like a binary policy uncertainty coming up in a couple months here, um, where 100,000 people across a few states are gonna determine the future of our climate policy, where it's gonna be very either or. Um, and that's a type of climate policy, like, so how do we think about like the political climate policy uncertainty versus the type of policy uncertainty um, that you uh, had talked about and then combining this with a question from Slido, uh, Diego asked, should we try to outsource climate policy to climate council similar to what we do with monetary policy for with central banks? And so I'll start with Johannes, but this is an open question for everyone. Perfect. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I think the, you know, the ETS price is just a high frequency measure of something that aggregates a lot of policy uncertainty, you know, in a market where, where we're actually trading these. So I think all type of policy uncertainty is very problematic. And so I think, you know, Heather and those of you in the, in the policy space, you know, trying to make not just pass legislation, but trying to make stuff durable as, you know, as, you know, across administrations, I think, um, you know, I think is, 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 is really quite important because I think one thing that's important to point out is just delaying decarbonization investment has real costs, right? So there is, there's kind of an important aspect that, you know, every year at CO2 is in the atmosphere, it contributes to warming. So saying, well, we'll decarbonize 10 years from now and we'll take it back out or something, you know, like CO2 isn't fungible over time the way it is fungible over space. So I think that's really important on the, on the, you know, taking it away from legislators and giving it to, to some sort of council. I mean, my sense is that every policymaker, like you know Jay Powell, etc., that people are trying to lay climate policy onto, tries to step away from it and says this is a role for the legislators. And I think, given the scale of the risks, the scale of the redistributive aspects of this, I think only as messy as it is, only a democratic legislative process can do this. I don't think 
you know, that's too many winners and losers here. The, you know, the fiscal resources required to do anything are just too vast to outsource this to a body of, you know, uh, uh, you know, benevolent, benevolent uh, technocrats. This has to go through the very messy political process that we have. Yeah, um, just quickly on both those questions, um, to, to double down on what Johanna said, I think that a, a climate council would be very challenging because this is a fiscal question. This is about distribution. It is about where investments are going. And you want to be able to pull in the power of the market to bring good ideas to, you know, to uh, to commercialization. But you also need to make sure that that works for people, families, communities. Otherwise, you're going to lose all political salience. And so the idea that technocrats can deal with it, I actually... I would suggest that maybe we've spent too long letting technocrats think about this and not enough time actually thinking about the community perspective. So uh, my view is is quite the opposite there. And I think that that actually directly gets that it that is directly about the durability. Um, when I think about the 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 biggest risk to my mind, um, and again, you know, I'm a labor economist by training, I always start with the question that the number of people in the United States employed in fossil fuel jobs, is about the same number of people who lost their jobs in the so-called China shock that has now been well-documented in economics. That to me is the motivating North Star because that had um, political and social and economic repercussions ac across our economy, across our society. And we, if we allow um, our policies to not be thoughtful about how, how this is affecting communities because it will be concentrated uh, because it's about specific industrial, industrial sectors, um, it won't be durable, but if we can flip that on its head and both support communities like coal communities and other communities that are, that we think will be most likely affected and do that, um, front load that, which this administration has spent so much time thinking about what's happening in Wyoming and West Virginia and coal, and coal communities. And at the same time, um, build out these new sectors in ways that are, that are going to create the kinds of jobs and and clean industries that are not going to pollute neighborhoods that communities want and communities want to invest in, that is what is going to create the durability, um, in my view. Uh, Adele or Christina, do you want to weigh in or we can move to the next question? Sure, I, I can weigh in a little bit. I think it's really important to use the best evidence on what the policies are actually going to do. And so I want to respond a little bit to what Johannes said about carbon pricing. And I would say, you know, I'm speaking again, my personal opinion, having done a lot of research on the design and implementation of various carbon pricing approaches, is that it's not the intent to raise energy prices, it's to change the relative prices of different forms of energy. And there can be a lot of shift in relative prices without actually an increase in that mean price that people experience, because what you're trying to do is change consumption and production patterns. And you do that through market incentives with an appropriately designed carbon pricing policy. The inflation question is also open because it depends on the monetary policy response to the change in those prices, right? And one advantage of a clear price signal is that monetary authorities can better uh, respond to that. And a lot of policies, for example, emissions trading, they might have more volatile prices that are hard to accommodate in a monetary policy setting. Uh, again, not speaking for the board, I'm just my personal opinion. And, and I would just say, you know, look at the data on the projected macro costs of a reasonably ambitious climate uh, carbon tax in the United States from the Sanford Energy Modeling Forum Project 32. We had a major multi-model analysis and even the most ambitious trajectory of carbon prices we looked at by, I want to say, 2040, it delayed getting to the GDP you were going to get to in the baseline by maybe four months. Okay, I think we can, you know, wait four months to save the planet, right? So um, I think we got to look at the evidence and look at policies that people are actually willing to talk about. And I would just note that an appropriately designed carbon pricing program might give you some fiscal space to, to do other kinds of investments and ameliorate any distributional concerns that you might have. So, uh, so I wanna come back to the literature on, on these topics. Uh, Mark, if I can. Um, 
I would like to touch on two things that actually, well, I think the three uh, colleagues have mentioned, but on, on the last point of Adele on, we need to know what policies are going to do. And I would like to add one of my remarks, which is we need to know what policies can, have actually done once we have implemented them. And then I come back to one of the slides of Johannes in which he has shown that in theory, subsidies for renewable energy will reduce energy prices and inflation but this is not what we are seeing in real life, and it's a problem of implementation. So in theory, our macro models, our uh, ex-ante evaluations or ex-ante appraisals could say, yes, this will reduce the energy prices for households, for firms. In reality, we are not seeing that. We are not seeing that because of how our market is designed, uh, because of how policies have been implemented. We've seen this case, for example, in Spain, subsidies for renewables were amazing. We have uh, deployed a lot of, uh, of the technology, but in reality, the cost of energy for households has been increasing because of problems in implementation of the policy, uh, mostly. So it's very important to take into account these two sides, because otherwise, as Heather has mentioned, we are not going to gather this, um, the, the social support that we will need in order to implement policies. If we are not able to communicate to the communities that we are going to take into consideration all the needs that they have, and we are not going to leave anybody behind, it's going to be very difficult. And for that, it's not only, I think, the role of national governments at some point to implement policy, but also in order to talk to the communities, the role of local jurisdictions and more regional jurisdictions that have a more direct way of communication with the communities themselves. Thanks. Um, so I have one last kind of moderator prerogative question. Um, so we've talked about kind of like macroeconomic transition risk kind of in like the broader uh, the broader economy. Um, but I, when I think about transition risks, I often think about sector specific transition risks um, uh, to specific regions, populations, sectors. And then we talk about like the way that people usually talk about this is like a just transition. So thinking about these kind of heterogeneous transition risks across like subgroups, um, what do we, how do you guys think about those? And do you think they are, um, they can potentially lead to policy derailment or how do, can we design policies to try to mitigate those specific uh, risks that could maybe uh, create some political economy problems? Okay, I can go. I was going to suggest. All right. Um, so, um, I mean, so the sector specific risk is so much of what we have focused on through the Invest in America agenda. And I want to be clear that when I say that, I am thinking about all three pieces of historic legislation the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, because they they all they were designed together and are being implemented together. Um, you think of something like automobiles, which um uh, is very important to employment, especially in particular communities across the country. And the bipartisan infrastructure law put in place um, funding for the EV charging network that can make it easier for consumers to make a different choice, right? From research by Jim Stock, who I know is on the video today or listening in, he said, um, you know, th there's a there's research that showed that actually for car purchasers, that's the thing to that was the 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 real. Um, tipping point, but then also thinking about what this will mean for um, auto communities across the United States and what it means to concede that the United States may not want to be competitive in the new cutting edge technologies and let's say um, China or another country take over um, producing vehicles and import them, right? Those are, are the kinds of sort of longstanding um, policy conversations that are based on a, se a sector specific risk. How are we thinking about the transition? How are we thinking about where the market will be not just this year, but 10, 20 years down the road, both in the United States and globally, what are other countries doing and where do we want the, U the United States to be because you have this historic um, set of investments in a particular sector? So thinking about um, how to reduce that uh, reduce that risk for the communities, for the firms, but in a way that is the most efficient than, than, um, that we can do. If I can just make one, I wanted to make just one comment on Adele's comment on carbon pricing, because I think one of the things that gets tricky is we talk about carbon prices in the, it sort of in the, in the aggregate as though it were one thing, but you know, the effects that you're going to see on, um, on consumers 
will be different if you are thinking about the power grid and how power, how a utility is um, allocating across different kinds of fuels and, and maybe how you are taxing that versus how you're thinking about taxing a, a consumer on gas before they actually have the capacity to invest in an electric vehicle. Like those are di very, very different kinds of costs. And some of the biggest risks are not actually thinking about the fact that buying a new car, very few people do it. They tend to be at the higher end of the income distribution. So you're, you're layering different kinds of risks onto that. Or I often think about um, moving from a furnace to a heat pump. That is a huge investment in a home. It's very disruptive, like who had the, the capacity. So thinking about those as you're thinking about the pricing mechanism is really important because sunk costs for consumers are very different than big capital costs for firms and businesses. So just unpacking what we mean by a carbon tax, I think would push this conversation a lot further. So thank you. Uh, do we, uh, Christina, Johannes, Adele, want to? Yeah, I, I would just say that any policy or set of policies that's very effective in lowering emissions is going to have important distributional outcomes. So, you know, backing coal out of the power sector, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're using a carbon price or a clean energy standard or whatever. If it's going to reduce coal consumption, it's going to reduce economic activity in coal mining areas, like by definition. So regardless of what your policy is going to be, if it's going to be effective climatically, you're going to have to grapple with what's going to be the future of those communities. And so I think, you know, I've done a lot of work in this area. I, I take it very seriously that when we're when we're trying to achieve our policy goals, we're mindful of any other problems we are creating. And so I just, as a moral and a, and a political matter, we've got to be serious about what our strategies are going to be. And let's be clear, some of these communities are going to be left behind by economic forces. It doesn't necessarily, maybe policy might amplify some of this, but a lot of these trends are already in place. And so, you know, place-based policies, policies that ensure the well-being of folks who need to retire early for a variety of reasons, social safety net that is appropriate for, at the community level where there are these disproportionate impacts. We need to know about those problems, anticipate them and design our policies appropriately to address those concerns. I don't know how much that will grease the wheels to policy adoption. Um, but I think it behooves us to get ahead of those issues and, and really try to help people uh, where they are. I believe it's very relevant as well and touching on, on Adele's to actually communicate about these policies in the sense that citizens have already uh, uh, narratives in their minds of how these policies are going to interact with their way of living and that uh, these perceptions might not be in reality what is going to happen or what we can see and it's very difficult to fight against that we've seen the case of the yellow vest uh, in France for example and it was related to to that somehow so taking into consideration these left behind places and thinking in a systemic way I think is the way forward. And when we think in a systemic way, it's like we are not dealing with independent problems. We have we are living with problems that are interconnected. And as, as such, we need policy mixes that take into consideration these different layers of, of complexity. And maybe we need to interact or, or make an, an integration between what we call climate policy with, as Adele mentioned, no social policy, uh, another type of uh, policy, labor policies that we need in order to make the puzzle work and not forget the potential trade-offs that, at least in the short to medium term, we are seeing or we might see. Okay, great. Uh, we already have a long list of wonderful questions from on Slido. So I was hoping that at least we can cover a, co uh, a couple of them. So I would appreciate it if the panelists can be brief, but also like succinct in what you think are the most important points to be made. 
So the first question here is to connect the session with the previous one. So the previous keynote, we talked about the progress on decarbonization is slow, but at the same time, we're also observing worsening economic consequences of climate change every day. So how can we close the gap and accelerate the pro progress urgently, and in particular from the economic policy perspective? Anyone want to take on this question? Yes, I ahead. can go if 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 you want. I think this idea of closing the gap starts by, you know, taking into consideration um, innovation together with the emissions that we have that we have to to reduce. That's uh, that's for sure. So how do we actually uh, manage to take into consideration the reductions that, that we need and this innovation? There are instruments that have worked in the past and that can work uh, looking at, at the future. So we've seen these subsidies that have worked. We just need to take into account what are the actual um, more second, I would say second order effects uh, that we can see moving forward. Great, thank you. Anything to add? I mean, I'll just add a couple of things um, briefly. I mean, you know, certainly here uh, in the U.S., one of the priorities that we've had, that the administration has had, and I know colleagues from the Department of Energy are here, has been to do what we can at the federal level to ease some of the perm permitting challenges and other barriers, other hurdles um, to uh, uh, implementing a new power across the country. So I think some of it is, um, at least on the on the effective governance side, making sure that we are working at all, again, here in the United States, thinking about how we are working at all layers of government to make sure that as we become aware of these hurdles, we are working together to, to address them. And a big piece of that, of course, is that we need to make sure that, that um, we're going as fast as we need to do, but we're also making sure that, that the way that new things are being implemented is not um, uh, leading to further environmental challenges, um, is bringing stakeholders and communities in in a way that is appropriate and, and still honors our democracy. So finding that right, right balance so that we maintain the support from communities is really, really important. And seeing communities as a partner rather than a hindrance um, is key to that. I, I would just add one thing that I hope is not the way we accelerate policy, and that is through an accelerated experience of climatic damages, <laughs> right? So uh, unprecedented extents of wildfires, droughts, extreme weather events, these are, these are wrenching experiences. They may move the needle politically, but I hope that is not what ultimately enables policy because we're at the big, you know, we're just at the beginning of the impacts of concentrations that are already in the atmosphere. And so um, I think that there's no time to waste. And maybe I'll leave it to other analysts to figure out the, the political, um, you know, array that has to be achieved to, to, to get action before that happens. Thank you. Johannes, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, look, I think I think it's basically the, the theme of, of all of the discussion, which is, yeah. you know, you need to get the relative prices of the, you know, of the renewable stuff down in a way that you can, that's politically palatable and um, it, that you can get broad-based support for. And so everything that, that Heather mentioned um, and also that Adele mentioned is, you know, is part of that process um, to get that done. So I, you know, I, I think at a high level, you know, everyone's in agreement on what needs to be done. I think, you know, the, the, the devil's in the detail. And I think, you know, coming back to Mark's initial point is that we can all speculate, but you no, know, before November, no one, I mean, it's very hard to you know, say, well, this should happen or that should happen. We'll have to figure out what the political reality is come January. And I think then we have to work within that to try and figure out what's actually feasible and how close we can get towards, you know, that objective. Um, before you know these damages that Adele managed are going to be there, so I so I think it's it's hard to come up with concrete stuff because, you know, what's a useful concrete suggestion differs dramatically by what the political realities are going to look like. 
Great, awesome. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just want to remind all of you that we can vote on Slido to choose the question that you think are important for us to address. So because of the time, I probably we will probably only have the time to go through the top few. So vote now so that your question can be selected to be answered by the panelists. Now I want to move on to the next question. And I think this question probably will be, will get a little bit more concrete. And this question is about central bank policies, such as, for example, um, open market operations or bank regulation. What kind of role do they have in mitigating transition risk and physical risk of climate change while maintaining financial stability? So I guess, Adele, do you want to get us started? Is that question for me? Um I think so, you didn't mention the person, but anyone <laughs> in size, we would love to hear your thoughts. Okay. So um, each central bank around the world has its legislative authority. And just like others, the Fed has its authority. Um, and then and then customs and in, in, in the way they've uh, implemented that authority. So in Europe, they have not just a mandate about maximizing employment and, and stable prices, but also supporting the policies of government. And that mandate gives them a lot of latitude to think through how their, their policies can help implement, you know, green, the green transition or whatever you want to call it. We don't have that same set of mandates in the United States. Um, and, and I'm going to speak not just for the board, but for other financial regulators, because it sounded like it was a, a broader question. So uh, I think that's going to be a, a jurisdictional uh, specific answer to that question. And then, of course, you know, the governors have their own views and they vote on things and, and opine on different approaches that we could take. And so, you know, as a staff person, we take the leadership of our governors and and, and uh, uh, do our work appropriately under that leadership. Let me just add one thing, um, not in any way speaking on Fed policy, but um, over the past few years, we've seen what it's like for um, the world to live through a supply side shock um, and um, real challenges with supply chains and bottlenecks and all of this. And we know that, you know, uh, and I mean, research it will will for a long time be sorting out how much of the inflation that we saw came from different parts, but we know that the supply side shock played a role. And I think one of the questions that we have to think about, about the, the, the relationship between the fiscal authorities and the central bankers is if one of the one of the outcomes of a rapid transition, if we move as quickly as we want, will that lead to um, future supply side price shocks or bottlenecks that lead to price shocks? And how do central bankers think about that? And how do they think about what the fiscal side is doing? That seems to be a question that um, I think we we'll, maybe we can learn something from the pandemic about how to think about supply side shocks in new ways that might be relevant for this work. Johannes? Yeah, so I think just expanding on Adele's uh, suggestions and comments. So my my sense, if I think about central banks, most of them have you know two broad roles through which climate change and various climate related risks play their role. The one is the monetary policy dimension, and there you know the 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 Fed has the you know the dual mandate. The ECB has a primary mandate of just price stability, and through the mechanisms Heather's just mentioned, right, a lot of transition risks might be inflationary. You know, Adele said, well, the central bank might respond to it, and so you know a lot of what happens to actual inflation depends on the central bank response. But clearly, that highlights how um, you know how potential climate related transition risks you know is something central banks should pay attention to to the extent that they infl you know affect inflation and you know the other macro risk then for the fed is the, the dual mandate but the other one is the financial stability right and so again here adele mentioned earlier on stress testing as one thing that central banks do to try and figure out whether or not the risks have reached a level you know the risks of you know, the macro risk that then sit on bank balance sheet, whether or not it's through their mortgage books or it's through their trading books or whatever else it is, whether or not those risks have reached a level where you know they do constitute a threat to financial stability. And I think it's really, really important that central banks all around the world do conduct those stress tests, whether or not they end up finding that climate risk is a financial stability risk and therefore needs to be further addressed in its supervisory activities. At a minimum, that first step to study, you know, region by region, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, whether or not climate risk is already a first order financial stability risk has to be part of the 
of the you know of, of the types of things that central banks think about in particular because it's a risk we don't yet understand nearly as well as some of the other sort of you know financial risks that central banks think about more traditionally so you know there's one thing to say you know central banks shouldn't be you know shouldn't be doing climate policy but understanding whether or not climate change whether or not that's physical or transition risk is a financial stability risk and then acting if serious analysis suggests that it is um, that's clearly within the mandates of, I think, almost every central bank in the world. And, and just to add to that, thank you, Johannes, for bringing that up. The Fed did conduct a, a pilot climate scenario analysis exercise with the biggest um, large financial institutions that we regulate, the six largest. And we um, we specified some both physical risk scenarios and transition risk scenarios. We had two modules and the banks analyzed their portfolios as we specified uh, under the assumptions of those scenarios. And, you know, there was one about a hurricane, another that they could um, design themselves that was appropriate for their, their portfolios. And then we did some transition scenarios with the the data provided for, by the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is an international organization of, of uh, financial regulars, regulators and central banks. And uh, I see Jay here, he, he's, his work contributed to that. So we have started the, the public exercise that you saw, but we're also doing internal analyses that are very consistent with our supervision and financial stability mandates straight in our lane and uh, really learning from that exercise. It wasn't a supervisory exercise. So we're not asking about the capital, you know, adequacy of the, of the banks for our, our scenarios, but learning the processes. How do they do these analysis? What can we learn from them? That sort of thing. So we're building capacity internally and externally um, just along the lines that Johannes just described. Um, so I'm going to let Christina, she has her hand up, answer, and then we're going to do a quick lightning round to end. Yes, very quickly. I was going to name the, the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, because I'm helping the expert network on research of this network right now as my as part of my uh, job at the at the Bank de France. There is clearly a growing interest in this. The network grow from a couple of uh, members to 140 right now. There is a lot of discussion about, uh, as Johannes said, about the mandates. Is this part of the mandates? Well, it will have consequences in our mandates. So what's the way in which we integrate that has been increasing. The NGFS has been very active in the creation and analysis of scenarios and data that has been used uh, worldwide. And in terms of regulation and banking regulation, which is uh, what the question talk about, I mean, there is a lot of room and a lot of discussion in this uh, framework of the NGFS about uh, enhanced transparency, about robust uh, disclosure standards and all these things that can play a role in actually greening the financial system and reduce the, the, the risk for the, for the financial uh, sector. Okay, so I'm going to ask three questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to stick to one of them and keep it relatively short in our last two minutes. Um, so you get the choice of which question you're going to answer. So um, the first question is a fiscally related question about um, options for uh, redirecting uh, fossil fuel industry uh, subsidies, uh, which the question the person who put the question says it's around the tune of $750 billion a year. Um, the second question was specifically for Christina, although if anyone else wants to answer this as well, could you provide examples of policies that target tipping points? And then the last one, um, I think this would be a great one for Heather, um, but and again, other people could uh, address it, is what do you think about policy options around managing job losses in legacy industries? Or should we think about uh, maintaining upgraded versions of, of legacy industries, such as blue hydrogen or green hydrogen, as an, as an alternative to building new industries? So lighting round, each person has 30 seconds to answer one of those questions. I can go first because mine, it was more targeted. 
So, uh, well, in the in the report that I mentioned in the project that we were the 10 principles of policy making in the energy transition, there is an example in particular for that point on the tipping points and, and targeted tipping points, which is the transition that the electricity market did in the UK from coal to as the electric or a system that has way more uh, wind energy, for example, on it, and the transition from coal to natural gas, and then uh, the increase in, in, I will say, in wind energy, uh, for example, and now green, um, green energy, but uh, offshore wind, wind energy. And there is this uh, very nice case study on how the carbon price floor that was established together with subsidies plus the electricity reform made the system in the UK change from a coal-based economy to a, an economy that was uh, clean. Okay, I'll, I'll take the one about options for fossil subsidies. I think that's gonna vary quite a lot around the world depending on the nature of those subsidies and their magnitude. In the United States, um, what people call fossil fuel subsidies are in many cases tax provisions that benefit a wide variety of manufacturing and extractive industries. So it might be something like accelerated uh, depreciation, depletion allowances, um, various kinds of tax preferences around investment. And some of the motivation for those policies are trying to drive oil production or fossil fuel production more generally domestically relative to imports. So it's kind of a complicated system of very detailed um, provisions that might affect a lot of different industries. And so I think unraveling those um, may or may not actually help reduce emissions because they may not affect the world price of oil, which is what drives consumption levels of oil, right? So you may find fiscal space from doing that, but you may not necessarily move the needle much in the United States on consumption and, and emissions, right? But um, that's not to say that in other countries where there are much more direct subsidies of fossil fuel consumption that actually change the price of those fuels, those subsidies can be damaging fiscally. And if you can, you know, if countries can find a way to back out of those subsidies and replace them with other ways to help people, you know, afford energy then that can be both an emissions win and a fiscal win and probably a social welfare win if you do it right. And in a lot of countries, it's not the poorest who consume the most energy. It can be the richer folks. And so the, the uh, distributional outcomes of those kinds of reforms can actually be quite progressive depending on how they're, uh, they're implemented. All right. Um, let's just move to Johannes really quickly, and then yeah, we'll I was the I would have picked the same question and given the same answer. So, given we're late on time, we should have had that let the last word have that last word. Okay, glad I get a different question. Um, so, I want to take this last one on how to think about jobs in certain sectors, and I think that Adele actually sort of hinted at this earlier. If there was any moment where policymakers should be thinking about equity and full employment, it is the moment that, that the policymaker also stands up on a stage and says, we're going to do something that's going to change how we power everything, um, right? For the typical person, um, understanding that, that they are going to be a part of this transition probably means doing more of the things that we've always needed to do. So if you are, if you are focused on um, getting your economy to full employment and thinking about addressing regional inequities through a variety of policies, that's going to get you a lot of the Way. I think the question specifically is about, oh, well, um, I, implicit in it is, should industrial strategy support any kind of sector or any kind of firm? And I think one of the things that we've really tried to do in the implementation here in the United States is we talk about it as being government enabled, but private sector led. Most of our industrial policy tools are um, not us picking winners and losers, but are saying, here's a bunch of tax credits for you to do things that we think are important. We want to crowd in capital, private capital, into the sectors that we think we want to be competitive in, that we need jobs to be created in, and but we want to encourage you to, again, make those investments in low-income communities, make those investments in energy communities, make those investments in places that matter and in ways that are going to benefit those communities. So I think that that is really this very, it's turned out to be a very nice way to do an industrial strategy that that spurs growth, but 
pushes towards equity, which I think then gets to this. You're not you're not saying, oh, I want this firm to su succeed or that firm, but you were saying we want this in these these sectors that are so important for our future. Great, thank you. So we are over time. Uh, so I apologize for that, but it was such an interesting discussion. I didn't want to uh, cut anyone off. Um, so I want to thank our speakers uh, for a great panel. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Um, for those of us in the room, uh, we have a, a lunch break. Um, and I don't know, Katrina could probably add a little bit more. And then for the people on Zoom, we'll be back at one. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to open up this uh, second panel discussion. Um, my name is Diego Kansik. I'm an assistant professor in the economics department at Northwestern University. Uh, in this second panel discussion, uh, we will hear from experts uh, from different fields on barriers to decarbonization as well as potential solutions. We will define barriers as stumbling blocks that we know uh, will obstruct progress at least in some aspects of the climate transition. And these barriers include technical, social, legal, or also political obstacles. In this session, we will explore these barriers, their implications, potential interactions and interconnections, uh, as well as solutions, how to eliminate or overcome these barriers in the climate transition. Very excited to have uh, four speakers. Uh, one is here in person, Costa, and we will also have three virtual speakers. So without further ado, let's um, jump right into the session and let's start with Shelley Welton, uh, who will give their remarks first. We will again have first five minute flash talks and I will again give a verbal cue uh, one minute before that. Uh, Shelley Welton is a Presidential Distinguished Professor of Law and Energy Policy with the Climate Center and the University of Pennsylvania uh, Perry Law School. Really excited to have you, Shelley. Uh, floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I have a few slides that would be great if we could share. So I'm going to spend my five minutes talking about institutional barriers and pathways forward. And in particular, what I want to do is highlight some work I've done recently on the electricity system. And I thought I'd begin by emphasizing why getting institutions right in this space is so important. And that's because, you know, we've, we've settled on a path where electrification looks likely to be a central decarbonization strategy. And so the grid is taking on ever greater importance than it has had in past systems. And it is distinctly not ready for this prime time role. So all of you are probably aware of some of the challenges I've highlighted on this first slide. We are taking years and years to connect new resources to the grid. Utilities are not building transmission at nearly the pace or scale that we need them to. And we're building the wrong things and it's over costing us by billions of dollars a year. Uh, one jarring research finding that I thought I would put on the slide just to hammer this home. Some recent modeling out of Princeton's repeat lab finds that failing to accelerate the build out of the grid could result in up to 80% of the emissions reductions benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act being squandered. So I think the key takeaway I'd like to leave you with is that the challenges that are facing the energy system are not sort of discrete, unconnected, substantive problems. They are at their core, a challenge of governance and institutional design. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so talk for a minute about what's going wrong. And here I wanted to call attention in particular to two challenges in our institutional design for the energy system here in the United States. Uh, the first is jurisdictional silos. We've divided responsibility for the system among an array of players, and these divisions are now impeding holistic thinking and planning. So I've put up here just three examples of problematic jurisdictional silos. Uh, the first is that states determine their energy generation mix, while the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC for short, is in charge of managing grid reliability. And it is widely understood that a changing generation mix is going to require a different set of reliability solutions than have worked in the past for fossil fuel fired resources. But NERC has a very limited legal ambit. It can issue standards that govern the operation of the grid, but it can't dictate resource mix. It can't dictate building 
more or different things. And so it's really cabined in its ability to dynamically manage the changing energy system to ensure reliability under changing conditions. So two more brief examples of silos that I have up here. Uh, the first is that states control generation planning, but FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, controls transmission planning and interconnection. But these obviously all form part of the same system and we can minimize costs, maximize effectiveness by planning them all as a system. Uh, but states and utilities have frequently resisted FERC's attempts to integrate forward-looking generation planning into transmission planning. And then finally, I put up here one third well-known example. FERC plans transmission, but the states are in charge of siting it. And that's created a dynamic where states can scuttle planned regional, interregional lines that they don't see as providing sort of adequate local benefits to them. Uh, the other barrier that I want to highlight is the public-private divide. The institutional structure in the United States for managing electricity rests on a considerable amount of private governance. Essentially, we've outsourced to utilities and other sectoral players the responsibility to plan and make rules for interconnection, for electricity markets, for reliability. And we've basically done this through what I call private membership clubs. I'm talking here about things like regional transmission organizations and independent system operators and regional transmission planning entities, but it's fair at their core to call them all clubs. And FERC has some authority to oversee these clubs to make sure they're producing fair rules, fair procedures, but it's often quite deferential to their outcomes. And that's a problem because utility and club interests increasingly cut against the public interest in this space. So one prime example of this, uh, utilities, of course, prefer to build transmission lines that they can include in their rate base, which then maximizes returns to shareholders, which is their logical priority in the system we've set up. But the country needs big regional and interregional transmission lines, which would save us billions of dollars over the coming decades, in addition to facilitating decarbonization. And utilities aren't building these. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let me, let me pivot from diagnoses to some potential pathways forward. Um, when it comes to jurisdictional silos, what we need is a better alignment between missions and powers, and then also stronger coordination among entities where we can't necessarily get that alignment. When it comes to the public-private divide, because utility interests are more frequently cutting against the public interest under current system conditions, we need stronger governance of public utilities and generally a stronger government role in this space. So. I gave you here just one concrete example of potential reforms. Delia, I'm club, afraid you're about you. to run out of time. So can I ask you to please wrap up maybe in the next 20 seconds? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, just the one concrete example I wanted to throw out there is that you know a club model for managing grid reliability makes very little sense in the face of a rapid energy transition. We need a public reliability organization that's going to look holistically at plans for the system and think about how can we manage reliability under changing conditions. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Shelley. Uh, this is really insightful. Um, I also should have said that as before, we will have Q&A um, at the end of the uh, flash talks. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in Slido. And as we explained, it would be great if you could upvote the ones that you like the most. Um, having said that, we now move to the second speaker, uh, Jonas Meckling. Uh, Jonas is an associate professor of energy and environmental policy at the University of California, Berkeley, and a climate fellow at Harvard Business School. Uh, at Berkeley, he leads the energy and environment policy lab and the climate program of the Berkeley Economy and Society Initiative. Jonas, really looking forward to hearing from you. Great. Thank you, Diego. And uh, hi, everyone. So let's leave it on the first slide for a second. Um, so I've been asked to uh, speak to the political barriers to decarbonization and political opposition by the public and business remains a core barrier to the adoption of decarbonization policy and more ambitious policy in the US. But let me qualify this. On the margin, political opposition um, is declining. The public increasingly likes clean energy. Businesses that have made sunk investments uh, are uh, lobbying much less against um, decarbonization policies. But within this broader trend, the public is polarizing increasingly around um, climate policies, and that's reflected by the very different policy paths in red and blue states. And it trickles down to individual consumer choices. Electric vehicles are mostly bought by Democrats, 
less so by Republicans. On the business side, uh, we see a transformation of the opposition, less uh, focused just on policy adoption, but increasingly on policy implementation, including through campaigns that legitimize clean energy technologies. So political opposition is transforming, but it persists as a problem. And given that, what is the near-term and the long-term outlook for decarbonization policy in the US? Next slide, please. So the near-term question really is about the durability of the Inflation Reduction Act. And much has been said about the strategic allocation of funds across US states and counties. And it raises a question, is the Inflation Reduction Act creating an electoral coalition that sustains its future existence by bringing Democrats back into power or can, and stay, keeping them in power. That's really about how um, the RA mobilizes voters. And I'm quite skeptical about an electoral coalition uh, developing around the IRA for three reasons. First, the electoral cycle is just too short for the economic benefits uh, of investments to materialize on the ground and voters being aware of those. Second, there are often attribution problems that some of these benefits are attributed to state policy initiatives rather than federal policy initiatives. And last, given the uh, climate of uh, polarization, um, it's a question to what extent the economic benefits actually shape decisions rather than ideological positions. So an alternative outcome is that the IRA is creating an advocacy coalition that would sustain the policy even under a Republican administration. This is about mobilizing industries that have made investments or want to make investments uh, based on IRA incentives. It's also about politicians in states um, that have attracted a lot of these investments. After the passage of the IRA, we saw a flurry of state level policies, clean energy, climate, sometimes called other names, but essentially with the goal to capture as many benefits um, from the IRA at the state level as possible. And that very well could be um, part of a coalition to sustain the IRA under Republican administration. The question is, what is the long-term outlook beyond the IRA for decarbonization policy in the US? Next slide, please. We know that at some point, um, the carrots, the subsidies, the, the tax uh, credits of the IRA need to be complemented with more policy sticks than we have at the federal level. And that's for two reasons. First, we know that decar effective decarbonization policy makes us have both carrots and sticks. And second, um, continuing the IRA approach is fiscally unsustainable. And a lot of countries that are further down in the policy development um, of, of climate policy have started with more the carrots and adopted sticks later developing a broader policy mix. So what are the dynamics that could lead to sticks in the US? The IRA could help reduce the political opposition by making clean te energy technologies cheaper by reaching um, cost parity, that's uh, electricity sector at some point, passenger transportation, uh, our candidates beyond that, it, it gets challenging um, over the time frame of the IRA. It could also help build political support for policy sticks. Could, um, the Clean Energy you Coalition have one is, more minute. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Is growing, and um, but it is still very fractured. There is a lot of need for intervention in strengthening that alliance. Um, on the slightly more optimistic spectrum is that politicians um, are seeking a tax reform that would bring a carbon tax to alleviate uh, public debt pressures. So the last slide. What are the takeaways? Political opposition persists as a major barrier, but it's changing form, near-term outlook. Uh, policy coalition uh, could likely sustain the IRA, no matter what the electoral outcome is. Longer-term outlook is quite uncertain. Uh, my bet at that is that um, technology-specific deployment and performance mandates are a more realistic outcome than um, a broader economy-wide carbon price, um, given the politics. Thank you. Great, perfect timing. Thanks so much, uh, Jonas. Uh, next up is Costa Samaras. Costa is the director of Carnegie Mellon Scott Institute for Energy Innovation and a professor in the Department of Civil and uh, Environmental Engineering and the Department of Engineering and Public Policy. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to Katrina and the committee and the National Academies for having us all here today. I'm very, very grateful. Um, you know, th one of the reasons the committee asked me to talk was up until earlier this year, I was the uh, uh, 
Chief Advisor for the Clean Energy Transition at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So trying to understand and communicate the barriers of the science policy ecosystem to implementation uh, is what we're gonna talk about here today. So here we have on the slide our, uh, our nationally determined contribution for 2030 from the United States that, that we presented at COP28. And that's that uh, box that says 2030 climate target. And you can see our current pathway is great, but above that box. So what we have is an opportunity to think about aligning our net zero pathway with our current commitments, but also our longer term 2050 commitments, which is all the way to net zero. So the barriers that we face are primarily about time. We can make more money, we can make more stuff, but we can't make more time. And we're about uh, uh, 30 to 40% below 2005 levels uh, for, uh, for 2030. Uh, that's great. We have to get to 50% or 52% below for that to clear that um, box there. But then ultimately it's all gotta go to zero. And so the barriers that we face really are first about information. Um, and the information is, uh, what is the trajectories? Uh, how do we uh, design the, both the policies, the infrastructure, the systems, and the social aspects to get us all the way down to zero? This is a live policy issue right now because the 2035 commitment is gonna to need to be generated in early next year. So whose voices get elevated? Whose voices get included? What information is there? Is it open? Uh, what, is, what builds trust? The second thing is it takes stuff, physical stuff. Uh, and one thing that we need to be thinking about is it needs to take stuff on time. Uh, we heard from earlier this year, or earlier this, this, uh, this session, that we need to ramp up the amount of electricity. We need to ramp up the amount of vehicles. So we sell about 1.2 million electric vehicles in the country right now, which is wonderful. And we've been really growing like, uh, like um, uh, very, on a very rapid pace. Uh, in 2035, 11 years from now, we have to sell 15 million electric vehicles. So roughly, rule of thumb, about a million extra vehicles every year we're going to have to add to the U.S., uh, um, electric vehicle sales. That has all kinds of downstream issues around uh, material, factories, labor, cost, um, and uh, adoption, right? Just because we're selling them doesn't mean that we can, uh, people are going to immediately buy them. So we have to make sure that they work for everybody. Second, we're going to, you know, we're going to basically have to uh, 5x the amount of solar and 3x the amount of storage by 2035. Uh, these are, again, same types of uh, challenges around supply chain, labor, uh, costs, efficiencies. So the third thing is about barriers, right? Uh, and so we, you know, what are the barriers to making this work, to getting us down to first half of our mission reduction and then down to zero? Um, well, I like to think about like, like a mega project. We heard about mega projects earlier. Uh, in a mega project, you don't say we're going to finish exactly on time and everything works. We're going to have 10 miracles and it all works. You build contingency or really you build a buffer. So really, we shouldn't be shooting for net zero by 2050. Maybe we need net zero by 2045 or maybe net zero by 2040. What would we be? How would we do things different if we really, really wanted to make it? And that's what I would be doing is, is building in a buffer. Uh, next slide. So the information ecosystem is informal right now. We have the work that all of you all do. It contributes to national and international reports. Um, that goes into our climate commitments. Uh, then that goes into potentially our, our, our laws. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act will double the amount of emission reductions that we'll have by the end of the decade than, uh, than we had previously, and also double the amount of clean energy. But then that has downstream impacts for materials, labor, factories, cost, as I've been talking about, and then it drives a bunch of investment. So that last chart over there is off of invest.gov, uh, where nearly $900 billion have been invested in the United States in private capital. Uh, due to the, in clean energy industries driven by the Inflation Reduction Act. But all of these are not a, is not a linear process like any innovation process, it's a loop. And there's feedbacks in between each one that we really don't understand. Next slide, please. So science policy need, uh, needs to step up. And the way that we can step up is, is do the type of near-term, real-time 
uh, research that can help decision makers overcome some of these barriers. Do we have the scalable solutions? No, on jet fuel, on heavy industry, on some of these uh, other issues, we have to uh, make performance and cost better. We know that there's a pathway, we have to make it happen, but across physical, across social, which includes equitable uh, solutions for everyone, across workforce and across finance, there are ways that the science policy ecosystem can be formalized and ensure that the next uh, energy transition this, uh, uh, that, we're, that we're guiding uh, works for everybody. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Costa. Let me also encourage everyone, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the Slido. Um, then we're now going to the last uh, speaker of this session, David Victor. David is a professor of innovation and public policy at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. He's also an adjunct professor in climate, atmospheric science and physical oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and also a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, pleasure to be with you. I, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. I'm also a part of BEAST, so I'm really delighted to be contributing to the Academy's work in this in this area. So I'm also slide shamed because I have no slides. I'm just going to do something outrageous, which is I'm just going to talk for my five minutes. And I want to make three points in my brief opening remarks here. First is I want to complain a little bit about the word barrier, because I think there's a linguistic sleight of hand, which turns into actually a very large intellectual problem when we study uh, system transformation, which is that people analyze what's an optimal system. They've got big models that have a bunch of assumptions of varying degrees of, of quality. And then they say, this is what we should do. And then and whenever we don't do exactly that, it's because of some barriers that somebody else is you know, responsible for. People you know, didn't read enough, or didn't go to economics class enough, or they didn't you know, listen to the engineers or whatever it is. And that's treated true to some degree. I'm a political scientist, which means I'm a, I study you know, why people make trade-offs, the dismal science, if you like, and then consistently do the wrong thing. But I want to make a point building on something Jonas said, which is that there is a theory of politics in here. It doesn't have to be an electoral theory of politics, but it's the political coalitions get stronger or weaker, depending on what happens on the ground. And that coalition changes over time. And so things that look like barriers today are different in the future. And sometimes there are opportunities. It helps explain why very focused policies for specific sectors often generate larger political support and self-sustaining political support than kind of generic policies. Um, and that's true not only in clean energy, but it's true in trade policy. You know, th look at what happened inside China, at least for a while when they joined the WTO. And so this is kind of a generic, this is a, a generic set of insights about the dyna dynamism of political coalitions. That's the first point I want to make. Second point I want to make is about credibility. Um, anyone who's worked on a big project that's capital intensive knows that job one is getting a reliable set of payments for your project. Otherwise, you don't have a financeable project unless somebody's willing to just put a boatload of money on the table. And they don't care whether they're going to get paid back. Uh, typically, projects are debt financed in one way or another, which means that folks are super sensitive about this. And almost everything that's interesting in the world of deep decarbonization is capital intensive, which means something really profound for those of us who study barriers, which is that the, the, the flows of real capital, and especially where government money gets matched to private money or private money alone is mostly doing the work, the flows of real capital are enormously sensitive to the credibility of the market and policy arrangements in there. Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance did this terrific study at their annual meeting in Germany in March where they asked people, you know, people who know what they're talking about are in, in these projects, what are the factors that explain success and failure in clean energy projects? Number one, by like a factor of 10, was the reliability of the demand arrangement, so the credibility of the offtake arrangement. So that's the second point I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to make. Um, the third point I want to make is is about the relationship between what happens in this country and the rest of the planet. I know that's unfashionable these days, but I just want to mention that a lot of the clean energy revolution depends on imported technologies and the opportunity to export technologies. And I think one of the great questions for the future, or actually the present, but but an, for analysts in the future, is how the chaos and all the onshoring is going to affect the clean energy transition. Because you can see it going different ways. You can see it helping the clean energy revolution. You could see it harming the clean energy revolution. Um, and I'll, I'll close by just saying that all three of these things, 
about barriers and a dynamic theory of politics, about credibility and its particular implications for capital markets, and about the interaction between national policy and global policy or global uh, or economic arrangements. All three of those are amenable to modeling. And indeed, there are some modeling groups in various ways that are working on this. And it's a just a tremendously interesting frontier where the classic models that more or less don't know anything about politics can be connected to people who study institutions and politics. Thank you. David, you have one more minute, sorry. Oh, I have another minute? Then I'm going to say one more thing. You, you are quick, but uh, I mean, you can uh, also finish early, but I mean- You know what? I said I'd say three things, but we still live in inflationary time, so I'll say one more thing. Um, I want to talk briefly about institutions because several of the, the panelists have already talked about institutions. And obviously, institutions are really important. They aggregate interests and, and they condition choices and they bias in various directions. So that's a very rich area. I think one of the most important attributes of institutions that we should be studying is how institutions deal with uncertainty, especially deep uncertainty, if you like, or in effect, where we don't know what the right answers are. Chuck Sable and I have a book out on experimentalist governance, which is kind of one strategy for dealing with this. But the reason I mention this is because deep decarbonization is going to be disruptive. Shallow decarbonization is not disruptive. So we're really good at shallow de decarbonization, but not so good at deep decarbonization for the most part, because you have you need new business models and you need the capacity to learn and manage this deep uncertainty. And so we probably ought to be studying how different kinds of institutions do a good job or a bad job in dealing with this fact that, that it is true in so much of the deep decarbonization debate that the right answers are unknowable in the beginning. And so they must we must organize a search for the answers and then adjust. We learn, if you like. Uh, and some institutions are good at that and others are indeed not. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, David. And thanks to all the other speakers. Uh, let's now open up the Q&A. We already have some questions on Slido, but if you have some more, please feel free to add them. Um, I'm also happy to start with one of my own questions. Maybe Sonia can then also follow up if she has some other questions. Uh, I guess my question also relates a bit to what we discussed in the session before. Uh, so in your view, what is the main barrier that sort of prevents more widespread decarbonization, given that, as we have learned, decarbonization costs are maybe not that high? Do people under uh, overestimate the cost of decarbonization or do people maybe underestimate the cost of climate change? Be curious to hear your thoughts. Please, yeah, David. Sorry, I was scrambling. Every time Zoom updates, something changes on. I'm still looking for where the hand raise function is. But um, I think one of the, if not the most important factor is around political support and understanding political support. We can't um, hear it that well. Can you maybe be closer can, to the microphone? Yeah. Is that is that better? I, That's better, yeah. Okay. There. Boy, we are more than four years in on this and we're still learning. Um, I, I think the key variable is political support and understanding that in a sophisticated way. And and, and here I just want to really endorse what, 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 what Yona said. I also think, frankly, we are we should pay attention to cost because we're concerned about the theme of this conference and indeed the whole economy, which is the macroeconomic implications. We absolutely should pay attention to cost. Cost may matter more for those of us analysts who are worried about the larger economic implications of what we're doing here than for the politics, because I think the costs are actually been massively overstated. And what's much more important is disruption and political support. So even, even things that cost almost nothing, organizations don't do if they can't figure out how to organize around that. And things that are super duper expensive and insane kind of like most rooftop solar, we do it all the time and people love it because um, they, they, they see some benefit from it, you know, even if they're smoking and inhaling some amazing product. And so I, I think we really have to pay attention. We should not use, when it comes to studying politics, we should not use cost as a simple proxy for what's going to be accepted or not. Great, thanks. Jonas, you also wanted to add something? Yeah, to um, continue the theme of cost, I would like to add profit. Um, cost is not the only determining factor for- Jonas, we're going to have you pause for just a second. We're having a, a slight technical difficulty. That means it's not just me. OK. In short, we can't hear anybody who's on the screen.
Can you hear us now? This is like Verizon meets the National Academy of Sciences. Okay, we're back, I think. Can you can you say okay. something, Jonas? Does that work? Yeah, it works. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just pivoting off what David said about cost uh, and to add the category of profit. Um, solar and wind and onshore and offshore might be uh, becoming cost competitive, but oil and gas majors are not uh, shifting from oil and gas to those because the profit margins of oil and gas are just higher. So I think uh, that's an important barrier. What is the profit margins that dirty versus clean technologies offer? Can I add one other detail? I, I mean, I think this is absolutely right. And I guess, I think one other piece of the politics of this is that clean energy is winning on cost. And, you know, I think the IRA is creating a lot of opportunity for companies to go into this if they can see the profits. A lot of these benefits are not necessarily trickling down to consumers, right? And so I think one of the big open questions is, Will the cost savings promoted by renewable energy and the fact that it's, you know, creating some propulsive dynamics in the economy actually turn into people seeing lower energy bills, which I think, you know, the equity dynamics of this and some ability to have people feel like we can do this transition without it absolutely decimating often already precarious situations is critical for the political economy here. Costa, do you want to add something? Or So the Inflation Reduction Act has been transformative and folks can find you know, what incentives they might want to qualify for at energy.gov slash save. And I know every single one of those incentives, but my mother-in-law's uh, air conditioner broke when it was 95 degrees this summer. And you know, I navigating that, even knowing all of those situations still took like you know multiple hours trying to figure out how to make it plug and play for a a, a person in who needed an air conditioner right away. And there was a supply chain issue is that we could get a very efficient air conditioner three weeks from now or a, a moderately efficient one one day from now. Um, and so the next IRA, uh, the next several IRAs need to be thinking about making it plug and play for every single type of consumer, um, homeowner, renter, high income, low income to make adoption easy, even when the economics work. Adoption has to be easier than we ever think it's going to be. I'll go ahead and use moderator prerogative as well to, to ask my own question before we then turn to the Slido again. Throw your questions in there, please. Um, I would also like to connect this panel to the last panel and think about risks. And my question is, how is a failure to address some of these barriers, or David will say maybe opportunities for getting involved, uh, how does a failure to address them yield certain risks? And Shelley, I think you were just touching on some set of risks, but I'm curious as to whether there are kind of leading challenges associated with neglecting these barriers. I, I can say something on the institutional front. So, you know, I mean, I think one thing that's becoming increasingly obvious and I think will become ever more important the further we get into the transition is that there's a massive coordination challenge in decarbonization in getting the right things built at the right time together in systems that work, you know, when we're talking about infrastructure that takes a really long time to build. And I've been sort of like beating the drum of governance reforms and institutional reforms as a key place to put attention, but they're wonky. They don't sort of have immediate political payoff in the way that substantive policies do. Um, and yet sometimes I think they're a really critical precondition to being able to basically accelerate progress. Right? I think if, if the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission had 10 years ago tackled governance reform instead of substantive transmission rules, we'd be in a much better place today. And I, so I think one of the big risks is that we don't sort of like get the, the institutional context right that can then accelerate substantive policies. Great. Does anyone want to add to that or? Can Otherwise, just, we go on to the slide. Can I, can I just say it was one other thing that, that Please. I'm watching pretty closely. 
So the IRA has been transformative in the, along with the infrastructure law and chips and so on, and what's happening inside the states is really impressive. Um, one of the things I find interesting is how the early, because so many of the things that are really disruptive are first of a kind projects or that you're building the first few. It's so interesting to watch the effect of the experience with the first few projects. Let me give you two polar opposites. Look at what's happened in Abu Dhabi with these four Korean reactors, which have been a huge success. Nobody's entirely sure what they cost, but I'm sure they cost a lot. But they, they're operating and they came in quickly and there was all the learning effects and so on. It's unbelievable. That will create a positive signal that then will create confidence and make possible more building of nuclear reactors. Let me contrast that with Kemper. Um, where you've got one project that early on had a whole lot of policy support and and you know the details are really matter and so on was it the right kind of design and did they scale up too quickly and so on but the effect of spending a boatload of money and producing no project that the knock-on effect of that around credibility and uncertainty and therefore risk in the entire carbon capture and storage business was re really really high um so some of the things you can do um there's some questions in slido about this but some questions that things you can do early on is really be very careful, and this sounds obvious, but be very, very careful with project selection and stewardship so that things that are coming off the rails, you kill early as early as possible and and, and you identify projects with high probability because basically what you're doing in these early projects is generating not only a lot of learning effects, but a lot of confidence effects. Oh. Uh, Jonas? Please go ahead. Um, I think one risk uh, on the political barrier side is um, polarization and how it relates to the development of different growth models in the United States. Um, because what we're starting to see is that, um, or what's very much uh, the case that uh, political polarization maps on um, low carbon knowledge intensive um, growth models and then a much more high carbon intensive growth models in Republican states. And the more the, those get entrenched, the harder it gets um, to change the trajectory of fossil fuel based um, states. And I think the strategy of the IRA in that way is really, really critical to try to diversify um, these industries or these states in their economic uh, structure. Um, so I think that pathway by addressing the structure of the economy is absolutely essential to also at some point uh, reduce the level of political polarization around questions of decarbonization. All right, so let's move now to the questions from Slido. Um, actually, the first two questions are related, so I, I, I'll bundle them. Um, so the first question is, uh, what in your view are the most effective uh, policies to overcome these barriers and accelerate action to achieve the US uh, 2030 and net zero targets. And then the second one is a related question, but directly targeted to Shelley. Uh, and uh, Rachel asks, what kind of federal permitting and transmission policy do we need to break down the barriers you identified? Do you see any path forward for that kind of legislation in Congress? So maybe, Shelley, do you want to start and then we, we open up to everybody? Sure, I'll try and maybe address the narrower question and then leave the broader one because um, it was directed at me. Um, this is a great question. You know, I think that there has been plenty of momentum towards permitting reform in Congress, um, but pretty specifically targeted at environmental permitting. And I'm not going to wade into the firestorm that is the question of like what exactly is the right balance to, to um, strike there. Um, though I think it's an important question. Um, I think I'll say more broadly, uh, I think there's a lot more room for envisioning legislation that while it cuts down on permitting barriers, which I think is really important, enhances planning, right? Like, I think the ideal solution for what we should be doing on the electricity system is having a federal planning entity that does big infrastructure planning of regional and interregional grid upgrades that are necessary and hands these to the utilities, which after all are regulated utilities with monopoly territories that the government has a lot of power to tell what to do and says, these are the lines you're going to build. You know, we'll give you a reasonable return. You'll make a profit. But like we need more federal planning to go along with less permitting. Um, and 
you know, I think the prospects for that really depend on November, right? Like as so much else does in the climate space. Um, I guess my worry is that what's going to maybe trigger reforms along these lines is the next big grid disaster, which, you know, inevitably is coming under current conditions, which is a, a shame of a way to get there, but probably the most likely way. Great. So let's open up. Costa, do you maybe want to have a go? So across the landscape of policies from supply push to demand pull, uh, there's a whole suite of things that could be done to uh, break down some of these barriers. Some of them depend on uh, whether or not there's majorities in Congress to get a, a bill that's not a tax or spending focused bill. Um, but let's assume that all of that is, uh, you know, uh, blue sky. The an advanced market commitment from the government to uh, use the power of purchasing is something that the uh, Biden-Harris administration is doing now that could really be expanded to uh, build out the supply chain and, and build out the landscape of technology and prove the technology for uh, new things around industrial heat, for things uh, around emerging transportation solutions, uh, for things in agriculture. Uh, um, there are parts of the emissions stack that need a lot of uh, attention in order to um, get us down to zero, but also get our cumulative emissions down as fast as possible. Because as we heard earlier, current carbon emissions are forever in the in the um, in the atmosphere. So the 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 question was about which policy uh, a ref instead of only tax credits, make them refundable, point of sale. Uh, uh, you know, distri uh, distributive credits that happen right at when you're buying something rather than uh, wait till the following year to file your taxes. Uh, the administration did that for electric vehicles, but it could be done for e-bikes and heat pumps uh, and all types of uh, consumer energy um, appliances that need to get um, upgraded. Thanks. Thanks, Costa. David, do you, do you want to add something? Yeah, just briefly on the question about um, for consulting and so on. My, my own, we should keep working on seeing if we can get something through Congress. This is one of the areas where, in principle, we have some bipartisan support to make progress there. My, my view is that we're overstating the interconnection and the FERC problems, not because they're not important, but because the state and local siting problems are the really severe ones, and you can't wave a wand over those. And because there's always some new new magical solution, and then it doesn't work because people get pissed off by these projects. And so we have to be pioneering other kinds of models that are durable, more engagement up front. You, everyone knows the list. And we've been running a few experiments, but we ought to be doubling doubling down on, on that. Also, frankly, on the interconnection system. The interconnection process is really all screwed up now, and we need a different set of incentives so these queues are not so long that they're basically irrelevant. But I want to speak to the other bigger question, Tim Linton's question about um, what can you do. 2030 is here already, so what you can do for 2030 is more or less you know, keep doing what we're doing. Uh, maybe a little bit faster and, and and so on. But between now and 2030, the, I think the largest single variable affecting the emissions level will still be the macro economy, not technological situations. We're going to be realistic about that. I think it's incredibly important that we signal direction of travel wherever and however possible. The the new coalition behind the IRA that includes many growing number of Republicans is, is part of that. A bunch of states have done this, more could do this. If you really start to signal direction of travel, then firms are gonna know where to invest or have a better sense of where to invest, almost regardless of what happens in Washington, hopefully regardless of what happens in Washington. So I think that's, these are commitment problems and institutions have a lot of ways of dealing with these kinds of commitment problems. And so I think that's very promising and that's something that the research community could probably spend some, some more time. The last thing I'll say is about, the question includes this kind of comment and not this, but includes this comment about net zero targets. I just want us to be realistic about this. Zero is a really small number. And so, all these companies, these governments are announcing zero targets. They have no clue what they're talking about. And the, the really big story in the next few years is going to be blinking. It's going to be, how do you blink responsibly? And that may be an unpopular topic, but look at Air New Zealand, the first and the most ambitious airline to announce target. They've had to walk away from it. Lufthansa is getting destroyed by their target, like on and on and on. So we ought to have an idea about how to be serious about ambitions without you know, getting hung by those. And also the word net is a problem because these models 
model that as a residual. And so they have these wild claims on carbon removal, you know, 10 gigatons a year, you choose some crazy number. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> Because uh, we're not really seriously studying how quickly that industry can scale up from, let's call it zero today. So I just think we need to be realistic about the role of these targets, which is that they're like a compass as opposed to a straitjacket. And, and they, the compass needs to be able to swing as the magnetic fields change. Great. I'll, I'll go ahead with the next question. And this is fundamentally about behavioral change and beha behavioral barriers. And the question is primarily which policies or which solutions uh, should we pursue that best address some of the behavioral uh, consumer decision challenges? Well, can, I'll comment briefly. Um, first, we need to understand it. There are some areas where consumers know a lot, and, and so therefore, the behavioral policies are to change their incentives. So we, we all know what the, what the list is. There are a lot of areas where consumers don't know anything. So for example, we're running, I believe it's the world's largest randomized control trial on electric vehicle charging on our campus here. We have a thousand drivers, roughly a thousand drivers who are members of a club. It's a good club. <laughs> Uh, you get discounts for charging, you get information, I think we gave stickers, um, and they're interested in, in, in their participating experiments. And so we've run a whole bunch of informational experiments. We've done experiments where we, we big, do big cash discounts in charging and so on. The behavior is all over the map. And one of the reasons that behavior is all over the map is because most EV drivers don't have a clue what it costs or how to charge at different times a day. In California, we're a solar dominated grid, so you want people as the grid becomes more solar dominated to charge in the middle of the day, so at work or at school, but they don't know. And so most of our behavioral tools in this case don't work as expected because you've got to solve an informational problem in the first place, or you have an intervention that has a, a, a unexpected impacts, again, because people don't really know. The other thing I'll say, and then I'll stop talking on this, is we finding, not surprisingly, a really big impact on the quality and size of the infrastructure. So for example, we built an algorithm that allows us to measure the number of times people plug in and plug out their EV before they throw the thing on the floor, on the ground, and then swear at it and go to, go to class. And if you have a lot of glitches, you're, the probability you're going to charge on campus next time goes down, not surprisingly. And, and if you just measure the, the size of the infrastructure, you miss this whole quality story, which is a really, it makes intuitive sense. Now we can measure it, it makes a, has a really big impact on the subsequent behavior. It just speaks to making things easy. And I think that this is an investment in resilience and mitigation. The, the grid has to work your vehicle system and the chargings have to work. The All of the appliances have to work and it has to be at the same level of performance or better and cheaper. And so that's a thing that we need to move from a purely first best optimization uh, straight line down to zero uh, thought process to a very messy over-indexed non-optimized but successful threshold policy of robustness. And so that really starts with making sure consumers are okay. Uh, and by being okay is they cannot uh, drive up to the last charging station and it be broken. Um, and and also that they can uh, uh, not take risks with the first, second, or third most expensive assets that they generally own, car, house, remember their major appliances. And so this is a way of investing in the care side of the economy and the resilience side of the economy makes the transition side of the economy much easier. Jonas? So the question is about behavioral change and policy drive that that's about demand pull policies. And I want to put this into a broader context. I'm in a project on uh, the energy transition after the oil crisis. And if you look at it historically, the balance of supply side and demand side instruments, it's much heavier on the supply side. So, and that's also the case with the clean energy transition. So I caution against what we can expect on the demand pull side. We, ha we have these imbalances now with uh, um, automakers um, offering EVs and consumers not taking them up, but the most effective uh, demand pull instrument, some form of carbon price is also the most challenging. Um, 
So the attempts to, to implement that have frequently failed in the US. Um, of course, the question is, does a window of opportunity arise? But um, I think in terms of what's really driving it, the supply side instruments uh, are doing the bigger part of the work. Shelly, did you want to add something or or should we move on to the next question? Uh, what was going through my head? See, it's going to seem like it's unconnected, but I actually don't think it is. Um, I read a paper recently by this legal scholar, Alison Gaki, and it was tracing the way that New York moved from manufactured gas to natural gas in households in the 1950s. And basically what they did is they got an enormous cadre of people to go door to door and help households switch over their systems. And, you know, I think thinking about how we can do that, how we can bring it to the people in a way where you're job creating, but at the same time, making this feel like something that's doable. I, I mean, this is anecdotal, but I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with friends that have tried to transition systems and been told that there's just nobody out there that can do it. I think this is an unsolved piece of the puzzle that actually has like potentially really um, important like economic growth job implications that are like a positive add-on to it. Great, thanks. Um, there is one question by Bob um, asking, you've all identified several barriers to decarbonization. To what extent are there research slash knowledge gaps associated with these barriers? And to what extent do we basically have the knowledge we need but lack the political economy. Please, David, you can go first. I'm just, everyone else is being so patient. I'm gonna just jump in, move it so long. Um, I think it really depends on the intervention. I think there's a big difference between shallow decarbonization and deep decarbonization because the disruption as a general rule in the former is low and in the latter is high. And, and in the former, we kind of know what to do in terms of the supply side and the demand side. I agree with what Yona said. Well-designed price incentives could play a big role here. Politics are really hard. Um, and, David, and I'm going to interrupt just for a quick second. Do you mind talking just a little bit louder for us? Are we back to this thing? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. A little gun shy here. Um, so I think it just, let me summarize. I think it depends a lot on, on which kinds of interventions we're, we're looking at in terms of the research. First, I do think this whole, this research agenda that some of the big system modelers are doing with political people who study political economy institutions, that's very productive. Jonas and I are involved in a project. I think Wei Peng is in the room. She's involved in that project. Others, Jay Gokul. I mean, that's incredible. We really have the capacity to improve the way the models represent the economy and policy. So that's a big uh, topic. I'm very concerned about the behavioral stuff. I agree with Jonas. Historically, the response to these crises has been supply side, and that's probably going to happen here. But when you look at the models, they a lot of the models make assumptions about big demand response on the residential side, EVs in particular. EVs are the dominant one. And we just don't know. And so that's an area of just tremendously important behavioral research because they have such a, there's huge power consumers and they could have a big impact on either adding resilience to the grid or undermining resilience to the grid. And we just don't know when and where that's gonna happen. And obviously there are gonna be different answers for fleet vehicles than for individual vehicles. There are gonna be different answers for v, v to G, which everyone's excited about, but nobody does because they're not insane right now. Um, but it could be really important uh, in, in, in the future. Please, yeah, Shelley. Um, I mean, first, we can't say there's no knowledge gaps or we'd all be out of jobs. Uh, but I really, I do think that there's some important knowledge gaps in the in the energy space. You know, the conversation that I've had over and over again in the last year is a lot of smart people trying to figure out, like, what is the paradigm of what the energy system should look like in the future, right? We have electricity markets, we have monopoly utilities, we have publicly owned utilities, and all of them are doing, you know, kind of a mediocre job by and large in facilitating this energy transition. And I don't know that we actually have the answer of like what the system paradigm looks like that, that brings us the right mix of actors 
to sort of take decarbonization goals and run with them from where we are today to the accelerated position we need to be in, you know, a mere 10 years. So the Academy has published recently a, a social science barriers to decarbonization um, of industry. And I think that that is the very good start to a larger research agenda for a, uh, a revitalization of social science uh, around decarbonization and resilience uh, around the, in, the, in the United States and around the world. Everybody is a climate researcher, they just don't know it yet. And so every psychology department, every sociology department, every English department should have people or everybody thinking about how climate and energy and inner transition and climate resilience affects their discipline and their research and, and their um, uh, the, the, the projection of their field. Because the, the energy transition is not going to work if it doesn't work for everybody and doesn't work for communities. And we actually need it to work faster than we say we need it's going to work. And so I think that we have the opportunity to do a reinvestment in the social sciences for rapid, real-time, and long-term understanding of how this all is going to work, and that will improve our chances of you know, getting to uh, a stable climate. Jonas? In the pull economy is a pervasive problem, but uh, I want to highlight one point where the pull economy is there, but the knowledge isn't to kind of continue what David said, that it's really intervention-specific. The IRA happened, the cool economy is there, but how to spend this money wisely with what conditional is or not attached or not, um, how to manage these institutions. I mean, the, the federal government, the Department of Energy has gone through a massive transformation and we don't really know how to do this um, in uh, an industrialized country that hasn't done much overt industrial policy for decades. So I think that part of this, this new era of climate industrial policy, how to do that well, we have very little systematic understanding on. We have time, I think, for one more. And I, I'll, I'll leave this question. It's about local opposition to energy siting. So local opposition to new clean energy projects is often cited as a barrier to decarbonization. Are these just anecdotes or is this truly a barrier? I I can jump in on this. Um, oh, it's truly a barrier. I think um, some recent survey work of developers themselves asked, what is the number one barrier? And they said local opposition to clean energy projects. So I don't think this is a, a false or anecdotal barrier. I think, and you know, David said this earlier, and I think he's right. I think this is a huge piece of the puzzle to be solved. Um, and, you know, I think the thing that's different about this is that this is really, by and large, a state jurisdictional issue, right? So states are Doing some interesting experimentalism here. Um, New York, Michigan, Illinois all have some recent bills that are basically trying to strike a balance where localities and communities aren't left out of the process, but nor are sort of like parochial objections allowed to completely stymie development. I think this is actually another great place for more research, really looking at these emerging models and asking like, how do you sort of maintain democratic legitimacy for the transition over the long haul while not allowing local opposition to totally thwart progress. And, you know, it's it's only going to become more of a challenge as, you know, a lot of de developers I talk to say often, like, all the good spots are taken. Like, it's only going to get harder to cite as we go on. So I think this is a, actually a really, really critical and fruitful area for future work. It, you know, we need to start with uh, investing in state and local uh, capacity uh, and that capacity in the federal government to ensure that uh, benefits reach all of these communities, that when permitting happens, that everybody's voices uh, is heard, and that um, we're not going to do the energy transition like the federal highway system built out in the 1960s, and that there's an opportunity to do this in a way that is equitable and just and rapid, that includes everybody and leaves nobody behind. But I think starting with uh, state capacity in uh, ensuring that there are extension programs like Bob Kopp, who is here, who has written about to the, like, how do we do decarbonization in communities from that community and in, investing in those types of human capital resources that are a way to uh, overcome some of these local opposition barriers. David? Yeah. Um, look, I, those are two terrific answers. Let me just build on them. Chris Field and I were involved in this study that came out about a year ago from the American Academy of Arts and Science, a consensus report, huge ideological spectrum covered. Um, 
And a big part of it was about how to improve siting. And part of it is, is you've got to create local beneficiaries, understand who they are and, and generate benefits. And right now, I think we overweight, we're, we're overly focused on the opposition. The opposition is louder. We also, for a variety of reasons, are more focused on that. We need to have more cases where the beneficiary is there and become allies of these projects. And I think that make, moves it forward. I've spent a lot of the last few years trying to cite facilities for spent nuclear fuel. And we're now slowly going to make progress. And other countries, Canada, Finland, and others have made a lot of progress by identifying the beneficiaries, doing what Bob Kopp and Costas were talking about, which is to, to, to create extension services to make sure those benefits are apparent to them. And then we change the politics. Last thing I'll say is, I just want to build on something Shelley said in passing, which is a lot of the local opposition is also key, understanding it is key to actually delivering on environmental justice. So it's not just opposition, like get these people out of the way. Many people have been really harmed by projects and they're worried about that. And we've got to figure out how to deal with that while also building stuff. We're running out of time, but Jonas, did you want to add a very brief comment or you're good? Okay. <laughs> well, then let me thank all the panelists uh, for their very insightful presentations and also to all of you for an engaging discussion. So also via the questions uh, on Slido, we will now breaking for 15 minutes and then we will reconvene with the poster sessions. Thank you all. Hello and welcome back. Uh, I hope you found the poster session as enjoyable as I did. I thought it was fabulous. Really great job to everybody who had posters. We now have some concluding thoughts for the day. We have about a half an hour together and I'm joined up here by the rest of the workshop committee that's here and uh, we may have some online that can join in too. I'm just gonna go down the row and everybody's gonna offer a few thoughts that they have after listening to our various sessions today. These can be key themes, key takeaways, key quandaries, uh, observations, anything is is fair. If we have extra time after that, then I'm, I'm happy to open the floor to anybody who would like to chime in as well. Diego? Great, thanks so much, Sonia. Yeah, I think one thing that I want to start with that was really important to us, the organizing committee, is to give this workshop a positive spin, right? Because oftentimes you only hear the negatives, climate damages, and you're so slow making progress, mitigating them. Uh, so we also wanted to talk about opportunities talk about solutions, right? And I think we did a fairly good job, even though we still talked a lot about also the negatives, the, the risks and the barriers. I think Ned and also Steve started off uh, with really interesting um, charts showing that how much progress we've made on renewables, for instance, how much these costs have come down. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that it's still a long way to go, right? Because You've seen a lot of different barriers, discussed a lot of different barriers. Local opposition, I think, was an interesting one. But also internationally, even if like in the US, we have now access to all these cutting edge technologies, how do we deploy them across the world also to emerging markets, developing countries uh, where a lot of the future emissions will be. Uh, and for that, I guess we need more uh, cooperation and also transfers uh, fiscally to some of these regions. Um, then I wanted to say one thing that is also more about the positives, because often we just discuss the costs, right? The costs of decarbonization. Uh, also, when you think about carbon prices, carbon taxes, people think just about uh, how this is going to affect their budget. But uh, carbon taxes, they also come with revenues, right? These revenues can be used to uh, do other projects to redistribute. And I think it's important to emphasize that more. Um, yeah, and that's basically my thoughts that I have. Thank you. Um, my thought is not very uh, groundbreaking or provoking, but my thought is that decarbonization is really hard. <laughs> um, and I think we already knew that. And just maybe just some of the things today just reinforced it. I mean, there's so many, uh, there's risks, um, you know, there's there's risks of, of political barriers derailing our progress. Uh, there's barriers. Um, these barriers can be in the form of, of making us hard to inform good policy. So you, you think of if there's barriers to um, grid planning and transmission expansion, and our models aren't really taking account of that, we're going to oversell maybe the effectiveness of a certain policy proposal. Um, because it's just going to, the model will just assume that we'll be able to build the grid out. And if you can't build the grid out, if you have those constraints, 
then um, we want to be able to inform analysis um, at the end of the day, or we want to use our analysis to inform good policy at the end of the day. And to, to do that, we need to take and do a better job as, well, speaking as an economist, as economists, we need to do a better job of taking account of these, um, these uh, non-economic challenges and barriers and think about how that can inform our analysis and what that means for policy recommendations. Because um, at the end of the day, what we want to do is like, you know, tomorrow we're gonna have a modeling session. I think we're gonna get into some of this tomorrow. Um, but how do we use the models to inform like good new policy and and, and steps forward and, and and do it so in a way that it's not just the economist just repeating carbon pricing over and over again, um, which, you know, I will, I will say it over and over again myself, but you know, we, it's not always going to be the opportunity to move forward. And the, 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 um, the challenge of the climate is, is we can't wait for a political opportunity for a specific policy. We need to take advantage of the policy options that are available to us at any given moment and be able to inform, use modeling and economics to inform what those policy choices are going to be. So um, I guess I, I'm going to agree. <laughs> um, I thought that uh, we started the day with a couple of keynote addresses, uh, one by Stephen Davis and one by Nat Bullard. And you know, basically they made the point that uh, uh, we've got the technologies, uh, but they went a little bit further uh, because we've always had the technologies if we wanted to deploy them. Uh, but th to make the point that these technologies have, have sort of made it over the hump into a regime in which they are penetrating the market uh, with or without the help of uh, additional policies and, and measures. Um, but they're not necessarily penetrating the market in a, at a rate that would be sufficient to meet either uh, Paris goals or uh, US national goals. Uh, and so the challenge I think in, that that the rest of this session has really taken up is really the one of how do we continue uh, to accelerate the pace at which these technologies are deployed? How do we ultimately get to the point, which as David Victor said, zero is a very, very small number uh, at which we actually have made it all the way uh, to zero. Um, we didn't talk in, detail about exactly how that could be made to happen. But I think that we have gone through the exercises enough uh, to, to know that it is possible and that there are multiple ways that you can get there from here. What we haven't done really as nearly as well has been to work through what are the policies and measures uh, that are going to take us from this potential to get to zero by the middle of this century uh, and actually make it happen. Uh, I thought that we had a couple of really interesting uh, comments. Heather made the, the point that uh, unlike uh, the theoretical uh, economists, uh, which were, uh, as Mark was pointing out, uh, who have been saying carbon tax, you know, it's an efficient mechanism, cost minimization, all of that good stuff. Uh, plus it generates revenues. Um, but in the reality of the US political system, uh, is that the perfect is going to be the enemy of the good. Uh, but the Inflation Reduction Act took a very different strategy. Uh, and uh, rather than taxing, it subsidized, it encouraged. Uh, it actually went down into details about exactly where things were going to be, be placed, uh, such that you created a national incentive that was spread across the country. Uh, uh, to uh, continue to develop and deploy technologies that will reduce emissions. It's unlikely that the Inflation Reduction Act is going to take us to the point where we actually will get to ne uh, net zero by the middle of the century. Uh, and so there are significant improvements uh, necessary in the policy domain uh, that, will, um, that will be necessary in order for that to happen. Um, I thought that Adele made a really interesting uh, observation that the uh, the, the risks to uh, transition uh, transition risks uh, and physical risks uh, are well within the scope of the uh, of of the the issues that central banks have to deal with. Uh, that it's not the only thing that's going to cause risk. 
that will need to be uh, mitigated so that we have financial stability. Uh, and so it, on, and, and introduced a note of optimism uh, into these uh, proceedings. Uh, but there is a lot of work to be done uh, and I'm uh, hopeful that we'll make some progress on the remainder uh, of this uh, workshop uh, tomorrow uh, before the end of the day. Thank you. Yeah, I feel that I learned a lot throughout the day and I wanna share two thoughts. My first thought is probably a straightforward one, which is like when we're thinking about decarbonization, it's not only about technology, it's really about people. And I think that's the overarching theme throughout the day. It is about people in the sense that we need to care about the community. And Heather and um, Shelley mentioned about public opposition, for example, is also about coalition. And um, Jonas made the point about this. And it's also about like the derivative of the human system, for example, how the companies can actually get the money so that we do the mega project that will be needed for decarbonization. So that's my first thought from the day. And the second thought I had is really pick up on what Jay was already saying, which is how can we get to shallow decarbonization, but then to deep decarbonization? If you're thinking about the technology perspective, Nat and also Steve in the morning already pictured a very optimistic picture. With the cost decline of renewables, maybe we are already on track to reach shallow decarbonization, but our problem is not solved because zero is a very small number. So we really need like new technologies. Those technology may still be in the air today. You want to make them work. Like we talked about hydrogen, we talked about CDR, et cetera. And it's only the technology side. We also need to think about what is the policy packages that will be needed in order to move beyond shallow decarbonization. And that's what we have been talking about through the day, that we really need to go do everything better and faster. And there's behavioral component. There is um, also like, how can we accelerate adoption, making consumption e adoption easier than, than ever? So I do think that some of that question, like how we are already great in terms of making some technologies cheaper, but how can we really get to the more difficult part, both from the perspective of laying the technology foundation and also the political foundation. Wonderful, thank you all. My reflections are in, in two components. The first is thinking about policy, nuggets of insights on how to design policy and plan for policy. The first is picking up on a, a theme that Jay just mentioned. Uh, how do we ensure that our policies and our regulations don't become the enemy of the good? And as David said, how do we avoid policy becoming the straitjacket? Let's ensure that we don't set goals that then become the exact reason that we don't pursue it, that we dismantle the goals at some point because we're not on target to get there. The second about policy planning is uh, how important it is, and Heather really highlighted this, how important it is that we identify the risks early on at the stage when we are designing the policies. Uh, and the risks include social risks, financial risks, a whole host of them. And then we build in the protections into the policy itself to ensure that there are safeguards and, and protections there. The second major theme are just generally themes that I heard a lot of today. And because I heard it multiple times, I got excited and decided that that's consensus. That means that we're all really thinking about these things. And these are topics that I haven't heard picked up as much in a round table before, but also generally within the, the broader body of literature. So just these few themes. Um, one is the importance of a range or a multitude of policy objectives. We're no longer just thinking about the objective of carbon mitigation, but we're thinking about a variety of other objectives as well. Technological innovation, for example, social equity and a variety of other labor, variety of other things. The second is uh, the really nerdy but wonderful topic of institutional design and the geographic and institutional incongruence that affects decarbonization both within the United States, but also I would argue everywhere else within the world. And then the third is uh, perhaps less sexy in, in this community, but just so fundamentally important, and that is the role of politics. And politics came up many, many times today in political economy. I heard politics discussed as a barrier. Politics was discussed as a risk. And I think politics is also a potential opportunity. So with that, I'll go ahead and see, do we know if we have anybody online who is a panel member? If so, I'll go ahead and invite you to unmute yourself and share thoughts. I don't think so. Okay. So with that, I'm going to open the floor to everyone who's here, roundtable members, other participants. If you have other key insights that you would like to share, this includes those that are online, please go ahead and raise your hand and I'll do my best to direct traffic.
Yes, please. I think if you can talk into the microphone so we can hear you on the line. Well, I, I first of all wanted to just start by thanking the panel, really uh, super insightful set of presentations, but I also just wanted to comment briefly on what I see as kind of the most pervasive theme of Prosadena. It's really a focus on pragmatism that has so often been missing in all of our discussions about climate policy. And I think that that we're not only seeing the pragmatism come in from the economics and political science perspectives, but also from the technology perspective. It's really encouraging. And, and I hope we don't uh, get so carried away with the enthusiasm about this new focus on pragmatism that we forget that we need to set the ambition really high. But I do think that uh, interaction between a greater emphasis on pragmatism and a focus on where the ambition needs to be is a recipe for a path forward. Thank you. Any others? Rachel? Um, I just wanted to circle back to something that Adele mentioned on the panel about uh, the real danger that we're at a moment where uh, some of the the real consequences, both physical and economic, of the climate crisis are becoming so apparent. And if that's what it takes to shift the politics, we are going to be in a world of hurt. So somehow we have to have market signals that... Uh, telescope that future into the present in terms of signals and incentives, because otherwise we're saying the only way we'll act is when we actually experience it. We're going to be doubting Thomas's till we can actually put our finger on the wound. And that, given what we know about the climate system and the inertia that's built into it, uh, the potential of accelerating risks, this is not just a smooth function. Um, it, it just isn't rational. So as we're talking, I, I agree with you, Chris, the need to be pragmatic about this. Let's really be pragmatic about it in the most expansive sense of what we face here. There we go. Hi, um, so just a few thoughts. Um, I am Kelly McGuire, I'm at USDA and I'm one of the ex-officio roundtable members. And I must admit, I kind of came to this workshop with a little bit of dread because I was like, oh, this might be kind of depressing. Um, but um, I, I sort of am ending the day with a lot of enthusiasm and hope, if you will. Um, and so um, I think I heard as much about opportunities as I did about acknowledgement of challenges. And one of the themes that I heard throughout the day, which was really kind of probably a little bit obvious, if you will, because of the design of this round table, but is just the multi interdisciplinary nature of this problem and bringing to the table all of the different disciplines that are necessary in order to really make forward progress. So we heard a lot about, you know, kind of the community side and really engaging with the communities, whether that's rural communities or whether that's um, aspects of the labor force um, or distributional issues and such. And, um, you know, that really is not just one discipline, but a multitude of disciplines that need to be brought to the table to really think through those issues. And so um, I, I see uh, more optimism than maybe I was thinking as I was driving here this morning um, in terms of, I don't know, just kind of an understanding and awareness. Somebody used the word pragmatism um, in this space that I think means that we are moving forward. And despite the uncertainties that are on the horizon, um, there's still, you know, hope that we're moving in the right direction. And there's some kind of longevity, if you will, to that, to that forward progress. So thank you. Wendy? So I'm going to try to reframe things a, a little to create even more optimism. <laughs> which is which is to say, like, I am wildly pessimistic about how, no, 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 and then I'm going to pivot, just wait. <laughs> I'm wildly pessimistic about climate change and the effects of climate change 
on physical systems and people. Like I, I'm an economist. This is not my area of expertise, but I have sufficiently been like, you scared the pants off me, right? So fine. On that front, super pessimistic. But, but I don't think that that was our remit. I think what we did today makes me really optimistic about how we're thinking about the problem as the relationship between climate change and decarbonization and the transition to net zero and how we need to think about that in the context of the macro economy. And like, you know, there's lots of things that scare me. Climate change is, you know, near the top of the list, but there are other things too. But like, I think we've actually, we're learning things about how we want to make sure that our economic modeling is intelligent when it comes to these complicated issues. So, you know, the issues about stranded assets, the issues about land use, the issues about what decarbonization means for financial stability, what it means, like we, you know, where we we have some tools on the shelf, we have some tools that we need to create, but I think we are, we're actually making progress in developing a common language. I mean, I don't mean to say that, you know, this, this effort began in this room, it didn't, but uh, I think we're developing a language to like make sure that we are bringing all of our A games to this problem. And so, no, I, I'm, hugely optimistic. That's wonderful. Anyone else, including online? Katrina, do I get to close this out? Do you have any, any messages? Any? We start tomorrow at 930. So please be here. Let these ideas percolate. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you for your participation.